The Boondocks is a newspaper comic strip written by Aaron Magruder that started out on the hip-hop website The Hit List Online, before being picked up by the United Press Syndicate, and eventually adapted into the subject of this video, also called The Boondocks. It prioritized telling stories about black struggles in the modern day, while also satirizing aspects not only of black culture, but the various ways it was appropriated and perceived by other communities, though you probably already knew that. It features the Freeman family, new arrivals in the neighborhood of Woodcrest, and its mostly white population. Huey Freeman is the main character, a self-proclaimed freedom fighter for black rights, he's often caught up in his own conspiratorial thinking, and is just as likely to criticize COINTELPRO as he is to deduce that Santa Claus is an Illuminati puppet master. His brother, Riley Freeman, is inundated by hip-hop culture, or at least the version of it that's televised and monetized. They live with their single grandfather, Robert Granddad Freeman, a believer in tough love parenting whose track record of civil rights activism is as extensive as it is questionable. The rest of the cast includes other black members of the community, Tom Dubois, a lawyer married to the white NAACP member Sarah Dubois, their naive daughter Jasmine, and an Uncle Ruckus No Relation, a white identifying racist who rejects and tries to separate himself from his own culture, as well as Sir not appearing in this retrospective, Michael Caesar, a more optimistic foil to Huey's viewpoint exclusive to the comics. The comic strip was rejected by several publishers before being picked up, as many executives viewed it as too edgy for syndication, fearing what might happen to their reputation for associating with it. The show itself didn't fare much better, getting into trouble several times through its run for its recurring punching up to certain real-world counterparts. But in spite of this tumultuous run, it still has a cultural impact today, as the messages it pushed retained its audience's thoughts well after the show finished airing. One more thing before I start the video in earnest. You've probably noticed by now, but this is a very black show, and, well, I'm white. I don't think this disqualifies my takes on the content, and I try to use a more objective approach to the analysis that I make, so I won't be trying to make any additional quantifications or excuses for the content of the rest of this video. It's about the show, not me. Though I, though I will give an advanced apology for speaking several African-American vernacular English terms in a moderately Texan accent. And of course, for a show that's nearly been taken off the air several times, I will have to include a content warning moving forwards. The Boondocks is a show that heavily features subject matter that not everyone will be amicable to. I don't make any attempts to stray away from this subject matter, even if I do sanitize my language a bit for this website. As such, listener discretion is advised. Season 1 I am the stone that the builder refused is the first line of Judo Flip, the theme that plays before each episode of the Boondocks. The line's a reference to Psalm 118, which, in addition to being a general reference to black spirituality, is also one of several mottos used by the 369th Infantry Regiment, or the Harlem Hellfighters, an all-black brigade rejected by the still-segregated U.S. forces for combat roles that found fame and success fighting as an adjutant to the French. Two lines later is Lady Sing the Blues, the title of Billie Holiday's autobiography. The ballot in your box, the bullet in the gun references a speech given by Malcolm X on the inevitability of equality, that if it cannot be done through peaceful means, then it must be done through force. That so many references to black history would appear in the show's theme is, let's be honest, not very surprising given the show's content and subject matter. And yet, while it sounds from my description as though the boondocks requires an extensive amount of research into black history to understand, that's far from the truth. Despite Huey constantly quoting Lebanese poets or dressing in 60s countercultural fashion, the boondocks manages to stay both understandable and palatable to mainstream audiences, nearly to a fault, as this means that it often attracts the attention of the very people it's trying to poke fun at. But this is just one of the stepping stones needed to be traversed when adapting a newspaper comic to syndicated TV. Writers can afford to throw in more pop culture references without attracting too much negative attention to the smaller relative pool of readers than they can get away with on television. Heck, the Boondocks comic was just as likely to have a storyline about black struggles as it was to make fun of the Star Wars prequels. But now there's a much larger audience, meaning that the offended parties will become that much louder, also for better and for worse. The Garden Party 
The story begins with a dream sequence of Huey inciting a riot at a garden party when he reveals the truth about everything to the rich folks there, something Grandad admonishes him for, claiming the new white man is civilized, and not worth fighting against as he did so many decades ago. But when Ed Wunzler, the man who owns the bank that owns the house that Robert just moved his family into, comes by to make sure that the Freemans are the right sort of people, Huey realizes that his dream might come true when they get invited to a garden party for the man's grandson, recently back from Iraq. Despite a dressing down from Uncle Ruckus, no relation, they attend and immediately make an impression. But Riley shooting Ed Jr. out the window, Huey trying to convince people that Reagan was the devil, and Ruckus singing a racist song about the Freemans all fail to give any pause to the partygoers. They simply applaud and move on with their lives. Wunzler tells Grandad that his grandson will be president of the USA one day and still be a moron, and then the two men toast to the old school. This episode establishes the fish-out-of-water aspect of the boondocks, not solely in the way in which the Freeman family's Chicago origins clash with the wealthy suburbanite attitudes of their neighbors, but in the sense that their perceptions of life outside their sphere are also inaccurate. Huey is named for Black Panther co-founder Huey P. Newton, and he, and he dresses like Che Guevara at the garden party, hoping to blow minds with his conspiratorial thinking and revelations. But it's impossible to open the minds of a person who doesn't want to do so. The idea that someone can be radicalized is based on the idea that the person's eager for some sort of societal change. Finding a person with a cushy life and attempting to sway their opinions is impossible. After all, things have been going well for them, so why should they care about change? Riley, too, is shocked at the lifestyle he's put into, hoping to live up to an ideal of rebellion much in the same way as his brother, but finding so little resistance that he may as well have not broken the rules at all. Rebellion needs some sort of purpose and some sort of target, and the two boys have found neither in the new white man that they're surrounded by. The only person in the family to truly have his idea of Woodcrest fulfilled, exactly, is Grandad, who takes credit for the movements of his generation, even if his participation is dubious, like a white baby boomer who pretends to have attended Woodstock. He's never had a true animosity to white people and finds no villains at the garden party. He doesn't find allies there either, just pure indifference, which is good enough for him. The Trial of R. Kelly The Freeman family hears about the titular Trial of R. Kelly, accused of urinating on an underage girl and being prosecuted by their neighbor, Thomas Dubois. Riley is insistent on the guy's innocence, or at the very least, that he ought not to be charged on the account that his music is good. And when the family arrives at the courthouse, they find that this is the prevailing opinion among the black community. Tom makes a solid defense using evidence and videotapes, but the opposing lawyer tries to shift the argument into an argument on race. That Kelly was only being prosecuted for being attracted to black women. He cites Tom's white wife as an example of this, and the jury ultimately finds that R. Kelly didn't violate any law and he's set free, although Huey interrupts the celebrations to tell off the community for rallying behind a poor cause. Not that it does any good. Meanwhile, Robert and Uncle Ruckus are discussing various similar criminal cases through history, leading to an argument over Ruckus's revitiligo, though the episode ultimately ends with the message that just because a part of your community is behaving foolishly doesn't mean you shouldn't have at least some solidarity. One of the most commonly recurring themes throughout this show is the idea that being in touch with your community doesn't necessarily mean that you have the community's best interests in mind, whether or not you believe otherwise. As Huey points out, the criminal justice system disproportionately punishes African Americans, but just because some black men are victimized doesn't mean all of them are, and rallying support behind those who are actually guilty makes the movements to free the innocent seem less justified. This can be weaponized in the reverse manner, by using claims of racism to hurt the oppressed and support those doing the oppressing. Tom gets attacked for having a white wife, the supporters of R. Kelly dogpiling another black man as his acts in the interest of justice get him labeled as a race traitor. But it should be obvious what the difference between Tom Dubois and Uncle Ruckus is. Grouping them into the same genre only hurts the benefits of nuance in the long run. It's an attempt to justify a person bringing others down by arguing that they were a victim once, so it's only fair. Treating Uncle Ruckus's views on Black America as valid because he's sure to have experienced some hardship due to his skin color ends up normalizing the behavior in other oppressors as well as deplatforming those who truly have the best interests of the community at heart. Guess Ho's Coming to Dinner While out grocery shopping, Grandad meets a woman named Crystal, like the Champagne, who immediately falls for him. 
Huey and Riley immediately know her for what she is, a sex worker, but Grandad stays oblivious as the two go on dates and he spends more and more of his money on her. The family argues logistics, whether paying for a woman's meals and shopping trips counts as paying for, as Grandad would put it, relations, or if that's just a regular part of dating. But regardless of the conclusion, the kids still try to get her out of the house. Their scheme to follow her and take pictures of her sales job doesn't work as Grandad dismisses the evidence as photoshopped, until a man in a purple suit arrives, a pimp named Slickback. At this, Grandad finally realizes what's been going on for the last few days, but he still holds out, refusing to let a pimp named Slickback beat her in his house and holding out hope that she'll eventually come back to him after getting rid of her manager. Huey and Riley are much younger and immediately able to see Crystal for who she is, whereas Grandad takes longer to figure it out, even if he later acknowledges that the signs were there from the start. He mentions a potential reason why. He's old, and so he's desperate. Knowing that he doesn't have many years left, and based on his grandkids' accounts of his lack of dating success, it's natural that he would start to adjust his standards and ignore evidence that might imply he's going down a bad path in his next relationship. Even if he is being taken advantage of financially, it's considered a small price to pay in the interest of having some sort of romance in his life. But reality has to come knocking eventually, and it does so in the form of a pimp named Slickback. But even when given the hard evidence of Crystal's actual job title, Grandad refuses to acknowledge that she's a sex worker. This time, it's less because of his own delusions and more so from his personal convictions. As long as he's treating her like a proper lady, then that's what she is. If he protects her from being beaten in his house, then the context of their relationship becomes more clear. Maybe the only women who are hoes are the ones we treat as such, though there's still a long distinction between morality and delusion that Grandad ultimately ended up on the wrong side of. Grandad's Fight When Grandad's car is hit by a blind man named Stinkmeaner, he confronts the guy, only to be taunted further when Stinkmeaner calls him names and scuffs up his new shoes. So Grandad throws a punch, only to miss and get beaten by Stinkmeaner's cane. Embarrassed at having lost the fight and having the event brought up on news channels, Grandad gets Huey to train him in anticipation of a run back of the first one. Huey, using his knowledge of Zatoichi, the blind samurai, to train him on how to fight against an opponent with heightened senses. But when the rematch happens, Huey realizes his mistake in assuming that Stinkmeaner was actually a skilled warrior instead of a blind man who got lucky, and he tries to call off the fight. But it's too late, and Grandad kills the man with his bare hands. He's not charged with anything as Huey had gotten a boxing license from the state board and made the fight official, but Grandad spends the end of the episode shook up from having taken a lonely man's life. Meanwhile, Riley was taking bets and serving as the fight's hype man, only for the angry audience to demand their money back when the match was one-sided, Riley only escaping by throwing a chair and thus starting a riot. Editor's note, I am going to say Twitter moment because I'm white. Huey describes a Twitter moment as a moment where two otherwise logical individuals throw their dignity and lives away over a pointless scuffle regarding nothing, a singular low point in an otherwise upstanding person's life that nevertheless ends up defining who they are as well as who they represent. But it's not so much that Grandad could have lost his life in the fight, but that he would have lost his dignity no matter what. There's nothing honorable about beating a blind man to death. It doesn't make yourself look any better, it just makes everyone else look worse. Because so much of the conflict here is entirely in the heads of the people involved. Grandad exaggerates how much of a hit to his dignity he took when ignoring the problem would have inevitably resulted in everyone moving on, and forgetting about it in favor of the next Twitter moment to happen. Like when Uncle Ruckus tries provoking Huey during their training arc, and Huey simply ignores him. The crowd that turned out to see the fight wasn't exactly portrayed as the most intelligent or retentive group. It's not as though Huey, who is otherwise depicted as the voice of reason, was much better. He's so caught up in the Twitter moment himself that he forgot to apply logic as well, assuming Stinkmeaner was a spiritual samurai instead of his first fight being a fluke, then hyping up the conflict to unnecessary levels. A Date with the Health Inspector Tom Dubois, after having his fear of prison assault made clear, is falsely arrested on suspicion of being the Xbox killer and thrown in jail. He calls Huey to get his name cleared, asking the kid to find the real killer to exonerate him. So Huey and Riley recruit the help of Ed Wensler Jr. and Jin Rummy to track down and bring the Xbox killer to justice. But the war veteran duo has more interest in terrorizing random civilians than they do in actually tracking the culprit, leaving the real detective work up to the brothers. 
When they finally find the location of the Xbox killer, Ed and Rummy take a detour to get drinks, but when the gas station clerk asks them to pay, they declare that he has a gun and open fire, with the battle breaking out inside the store, pinning down the Freeman brothers and preventing them from apprehending the killer. In the end, the Xbox killer struck a second time while Tom was in jail, and he's let out, while Ed and Rummy manage to come out on top in the firefight, receiving praise for their heroic deeds in keeping America safe from vague threats. Ed Wunzler Jr. and Jen Rummy are stand-ins for George W. Bush and Donald Rumsfeld, even down to Rummy borrowing many of the malapropisms of the, at the time, Secretary of Defense. The episode parallels the search for WMDs in the Middle East, down to the directionless search of the soldiers, their missed conclusion, and the heaps of praise they received from their mission accomplished. It's not a secret that Aaron Magruder was highly critical of the Bush campaign. He was one of the most consistent targets of the comic satire next to the Star Wars prequels, so an episode that parodies the aimless war with a misguided target was practically an inevitability. As long as the victims of their shooting spree get labeled as terrorists, when the fighting is done, they get to walk away like they're the good guys. It plays on the absence of common sense in an atmosphere of fear that's so common. Tom Dubois is a prosecutor for a living. He's aware of his rights and sees through the police detective's attempts to make him confess. Despite this, he's still fearful enough of going to prison that he confesses anyway, knowing it won't end well. And of course, the officer inside the gas station that Ed and Rummy shot up was also exploited as the two shouted at him long enough that he began to believe that the attendant had a gun, even though he didn't. People are willing to believe anything if they're scared, especially if there's no clear outlet for their fear. The Story of Gangstalicious Riley finds out his idol Gangstalicious has been shot again, and is currently in a hospital near Woodcrest recovering. He sets out to go meet his hero and to protect him, though Riley struggles to get Grandad's approval to go out of the house and has to resort to reverse psychology to leave. But upon showing up and meeting the man, Riley learns that Gangstalicious isn't as tough as he was posturing himself to be, constantly afraid of the men who shot him returning and fleeing when Riley notices them in the lobby. The two run away, stealing a car from a fan and, and leading the three men after them into a car chase which results in getting caught. While tied up in the trunk, Gangstalicious finally comes clean about his persona, that he only pretended to be tough because it got him respect, but that it wasn't who he truly was. Ultimately, the men from before prepare to execute him, because Gangstalicious cheated on their leader and broke his heart. But they miss every shot and Riley passes out, returning home after he comes to and exaggerating the story as he relays the events to Huey. Gangstalicious, like any pop cultural icon, is largely a personality put on to sell records through an aesthetic. This is something done in every industry to various levels of acceptance from the audience, to the smart marks of wrestling fans who know it's exaggerated but enjoy the theater of it all, to the snake oil salesmen of wellness gurus who push a product with a high markup while pretending to be an authority. In the middle ground, it's not as though any of this is inherently bad. The purpose of any art form is largely a combination of escapism and catharsis. An artist puts on a fake personality to play up the realism and relatability of their work. Even Gangstalicious in Universe finds success with his song Thug in Love, which at the end of the episode is revealed to be based on his lover, the same scorned man who had made an attempt on his life. And while there's still some exaggeration of the personality of the man singing it, it's a song based on his real experiences. Though for some people, the style is more important than the substance, leading to an issue where a fan puts their favorite creator on a pedestal without critically thinking about why they gave that person so much respect, or thinking about whether the messaging applies to them as well. A Huey Freeman Christmas Disappointed with the culturally sensitive depictions of Kwanzaa during his history class, Huey is given the opportunity to direct the school's Christmas play, with complete creative control. He immediately increases the scale and scope of the project, hiring better talent, firing the school children, and ultimately going way over budget. But the principal steps in and demands a few script changes, notably that Jesus can't be black, and Huey ultimately steps down from the project. But in spite of this, his history teacher goes on with it anyway, receiving a standing ovation for Huey's vision of the Christmas story, even if a PTA boycott resulted in a minuscule audience. Meanwhile, Riley continuously assaults the mall Santas for not giving him any presents, which results in Uncle Ruckus playing the man. 
The children are too put off by his general presence, and Jasmine has a crisis of her faith in Santa, though Ruckus comes back to cheer her up with a white lie about the incident. Mr. Uberwitz, Huey's history teacher, is portrayed as an oversensitive type, the type of person who goes so far out of their way to show how non-bigoted they are that it loops back around to a completely different type of bigotry. In his attempt to add more voices to the conversation, he takes a completely uncritical approach to these voices, giving Huey enough creative control to tell a story that errs on the completely opposite side, being culturally insensitive to the point of practical erasure. In reality, the Arab population of the Levant did not show up until Muslim conquests centuries later, so Jesus was unambiguously Jewish, still a far cry from the blonde-haired and blue-eyed Aryan Jesus as he's typically depicted as in the West, but not Huey's vision either. And all of this plays into the absolute void of proper contextualization that surrounds the winter holiday season in general. Contrary to Huey's claims, Christmas was never a pagan holiday. That was something invented by Puritans to further discredit Orthodox Christianity and distance their washed-out version of the holiday from its proper origins. Not that this version of Christmas matters anyway during the 21st century. Ironically enough, the only person in this episode who has a close approximation of the true spirit of the holiday season is Jasmine herself. That Santa died for our presence and moved to the North Pole is the most accurate version of the commodified holiday that we celebrate today. The Real When Riley notices that Grandad's new sunglasses make him look blind, instead of like Bill Cosby like he thought they would, he gets the idea to make up a sob story about his blind grandfather to submit to Pimp My Ride. Grandad goes along with this grift, hoping to get Dorothy, his car, a makeover. But shortly after the car is taken away, more crewmen show up to start tearing down the house with the idea to construct a new wing onto it as part of a home renovation show. Huey tries to warn them that this is a bad idea, but he's ignored any time he mentions this, as well as any time he mentions that he's being trailed by a government agent that he names White Shadow. The episode progresses and the Freemans get more involved with the lie, tipping when Dorothy shows up again and Grandad forgets to act blind as he ogles his new car. This causes the crewmen to leave in disgust, with the house still being partially dismantled. In the end, Exhibit's lawyers tell him that he can't keep the Freeman's car, so he returns it, as well as giving them the bill for the upgrades, and the family sleeps in the seats while Huey convinces himself that he's not really being followed. Huey gets constantly ignored, not just in this episode, but the series in general. No matter how much he warns people about the consequences of their actions, they go through with it all anyway. They find out, so to speak. It gets to the point that he's so sick of being ignored that Huey finally opts to imagine an escapist situation, one in which there's a person who actually listens to him no matter what. White Shadow is a figment of Huey's imagination, like the Tooth Fairy, or Tom's chances at being a professional singer, or the high life Huey and Grandad will live by pretending to be a blind homeless shelter owner. Huey gets off more easily than the others, but he still has to have a moment of gaining that consciousness. He believes himself to be more aware of the way the world works than anybody else, and yet for all his knowledge, he still manages to have no more influence on events than those who stay ignorant. And of course, seeing that all the hardship that Riley's grift inflicted on the family has barely taught them anything, Huey ends the episode with a sense of helplessness. He prides himself on the promotion of individuality and free thinking, and yet wants people to listen to him instead of learning their own lessons. And if they're incapable of learning from their mistakes, then it was a waste of time to try to teach them the easy way in the first place. Return of the King The story begins with a recap of an alternate future, one in which Martin Luther King Jr. never died and instead went into a coma for 30 years. After waking up, he attempted a return to his previous work for civil rights, only to wind up hated by the whole country after refusing to get caught up in post-9-11 jingoism. It then catches up to the modern day, where Huey meets him at a book signing and Grandad invites him to dinner, the two having fought together back in the 60s. King's reputation still hasn't been forgotten, so Huey convinces him to start a political party and an urban promotion team is hired to build hype. But this attracts the wrong type of crowd and the event turns into a party, with the bouncers not even recognizing the keynote speaker. When King finally gets to take the stage, he struggles to get the audience's attention before he snaps afterwards breaking into an angry tirade about the modern state of black culture before retiring to Canada. The episode then ends on an optimistic note, with a new civil rights movement starting up that results in Oprah becoming president. 
For all the posturing that people make today about supporting the ideals of MLK, very little of his actual belief system is implemented in a society run by the same people. They named a holiday after him and a few streets, then quietly tried to hope everyone forgot about his political beliefs outside of racial relations. Even these are largely ignored in favor of optics. Put a picture of the guy in a store, and then continue to only cast white people in your commercials. It's the capitalist equivalent of saying, some of my best friends are black. The episode even makes a point that many of King's beliefs today would be considered treasonous opinions. Not blindly supporting one's country is considered not being patriotic, which itself is a term practically devoid of any meaning. To try to improve a system or enact justice is like making a claim that it's not perfect, which those who are content with the state of things view as a personal attack. It's a fallacious argument, like claiming that loving oneself means engorging yourself with junk food instead of taking care of your body. This episode is also notorious for being one of the first big scandals of the show's history. A few voices were already critical of the use of a certain word, and to depict it as coming out of the mouth of a beloved political leader was considered too far. Though Adult Swim stood by Magruder's decision, keeping the episode in syndication with a statement about the necessity of its message, a message that won Return of the King, a Peabody Award for its daring. The Itis Onceler, after having a taste of Grandad's soul food, gets the idea to introduce the food to a restaurant he owns to change up the style. This new restaurant, named The Itis after the sleepy sensation one gets after a big meal, is an instant hit and Grandad is soon catapulted into popularity, with table space, bed space, being sold out near constantly. But the effects this food has on the health of the consumer starts to take a toll, as the customer base gets progressively more obese and desperate to get their hands on another meal, to the point that many of them go broke and take up residence in the nearby park. The neighborhood starts to get more dangerous as people get mugged by those addicted to the itis, and soon, people begin to litigate, suing Grandad and Wunzler for the liposuction bills. The restaurant shuts down and Grandad takes the lesson to heart, changing up the menu of his Sunday dinners while the Wunzler buys the cheap property surrounding the old restaurant. Soul food is treated as a harmful vice in this episode, the kind of thing that gets people hooked and ultimately killed while reducing the quality of life of the person eating it and everyone around them. That no matter how good something tastes, you shouldn't overindulge just because the people around you are doing it too. Fried Ofal is treated as a part of the culture that Grandad grew up in, but as pointed out by Chico, the chef, this tradition was born out of necessity, as deep frying things was the only way to make the leftover unwanted meats offered to slaves palatable. This then ties into the secondary message that the episode made, that a harmful itis introduced to the black community devastated the people who consumed it to the benefit of the party that pushed it in the first place. Ed Wunzler was the one who pushed Grandad into opening his restaurant in the first place, claiming that he owned all the nearby businesses except the memorial park across the street. In the end of the episode, his real motivation is made clear. He wanted to devalue the neighborhood enough that the park became cheap so he could buy it discounted and control more of the land. Considering that the symptoms of repeated consumption of soul food include increased poverty and crime, and that Wunzler is also the one who insists on beefing up security to further increase the amount of violence occurring, the parallel to the war on drugs is anything but coincidental. Let's nab Oprah. Riley accompanies Ed and Rummy on a plot to rob a bank nearby, but they make a terrible time and only get away with it due to the bank being owned by Ed's father. They're demotivated by their lack of skills until learning that Oprah is in town, and they plan on getting famous and rich by kidnapping her for ransom. But this plan goes even worse as they break into the wrong bookstore and kidnap Maya Angelou instead. Still not deterred, they make a backup plan to break into her studio to do it properly this time, even putting some planning into their effort beforehand that results in learning that Bushido Brown, a karate legend, is protecting her. When Huey learns that Riley is hanging out with the bad crowd, he sets out to stop the plan himself, but encounters Bushido Brown and ends up losing a fight against the guy, serving as a distraction for Riley and co. to go in through the back. But they take a wrong turn and kidnap Bill Cosby instead, returning him 15 minutes later as his rambling was too annoying, and the episode ends with Huey dragging Riley back home. 
As much as The Boondocks maintains a reputation for its subversive and at times shocking political commentary, it's also retained a significant place in the memory of those who watched it due to the visuals presented. The Boondocks' animation work was done through Madhouse, a studio with a long reputation, something that the burgeoning network of Adult Swim was also able to capitalize on as their reputation for programming up to this point was conceptually ambitious, though hardly visually so. As such, the Boondocks managed to set a high standard for the fluidity of movement in choreographed fight scenes in its western properties, something meant to be compared to the visuals of the anime that aired alongside it. And this anime influence is not something meant to be at all subtle. Aaron Magruder is notoriously a big fan of Japanese animation, though among his other interests, this one was rarely able to be showcased in the much more mainstream-friendly mediums in which he worked before. So having the Boondocks air alongside anime gave him a chance to stop holding back his inner otaku, and we ended up being treated to a show that was a significant bump in quality that can only come from a love of the medium. Riley was here. Riley tags a house with his name, receiving tips from an anonymous man on how to make better use of his canvas space. But he gets caught and scolded by Grandad, who decides to punish Riley by teaching him proper art through a private tutor, the man who taught him before. This teacher uses some reverse psychology at first, taunting Riley with doubts about his abilities to convince the kid to try harder, and once he gets through to him, the duo starts to make more ambitious murals on the houses in Woodcrest. But Riley's upset about doing this work and not getting credited for it, as no one believes he's capable of any such thing. So he instead creates a piece that's too personal for anyone else to plagiarize, copying a wedding photo of his family and putting it on his own house. The teacher and Riley nearly get caught by the police, ending the saga with a chase before winding up back at the house where Grandad very nearly shows a bit of genuine appreciation. In the B-plot, Huey decides to test the effect of black television on a person's physical health, but grows too lazy to bother finishing the experiment. Riley's artistic ability is doubted throughout the episode after his first run-in with the law. People are astonished by the works that he creates, but any time he tries to make a claim to them, they're dismissed because people can't associate the art and the artist. And while his teacher attempts to assuage him that it's better this way, true art being its own reward, Riley has higher ambitions. These ambitions are just as valid, though. It's completely normal to want to achieve some sort of immortality through your work, to have your creations outlast yourself. This is precisely what Riley was trying to do at the beginning of the episode by tagging a house with his name. And yet, in spite of all his improvement, he still fails to see any true appreciation once he does manage to get his ownership across. Graffiti, as an art form, has far too much association with the basic tagging that's commonly done on the sides of buildings and abandoned concrete spaces. So it all gets lumped together by any individual unwilling to make the distinction, just like so many other, often black, art forms. Huey's B-plot, while being borrowed from the original comic strip, is shown to reflect the low end of mainstream culture that so many think of when they consider black media works. Aaron Magruder being a person responsible for a black TV show, making fun of black TV shows, has to be aware of this dichotomy. Just as much as any person who tries to convince others of the distinction and quality between popular hip-hop and what one might hear from, say, a Sheru. Wingmen The Freeman family learns about the death of Mo, Robert's wingman during his pilot days. They go back to Chicago to attend the funeral, as it was Moe's last wish that Grandad give the eulogy, and Huey also plans on reuniting with one of his old friends, Cairo. On the flight, Robert regales the tale of how Moe was always obnoxious, talking himself up without doing much to back it up, and even stealing a girl from him decades ago. Grandad reads a speech, written by Moe himself, that's self-serving and even outright false, so Robert disregards it and talks about how he really feels about the guy, turning the rest of the mourners on him as well. But near the end of the funeral, Robert learns the truth, that the girl who was stolen from him all those years ago was never really his in the first place as well as aging poorly, and that Moe wasn't all that bad. Meanwhile, Huey's reunion with his old friend is going poorly as Cairo is now spending his time around Dewey, a poser revolutionary who argues with Huey at every chance. As it turns out, they view the Freemans as traitors for moving away. But after Grandad apologizes in a follow-up speech, Huey decides to be the bigger man and make his peace with Cairo, although his peace offering is rejected. Both Robert and Huey attempt to make peace with someone from their past in this episode, while encountering two different obstacles to this mission. In Robert's case, he's not able to make any sort of reconciliation with Moe, as Moe is dead, meaning that whatever bad blood remains will have to persist indefinitely, as they can't talk it out or properly put it behind them. 
and Huey encounters the issue of Cairo not wanting to forgive him for moving away, something Huey had no say in. Just because Huey is willing to put bygones behind him doesn't mean that the others involved in the issue have the same interest. So the episode ultimately has to contend with what to do when you want to be the bigger man, but no one around you is willing to accept this fact, and that's part of what being the bigger man entails. It's not about showing off how good of a guy you are because you want the credit for it, but doing a good deed for its own sake. To forgive because other people are pressuring you to do so doesn't actually make you a good person. It's only a good deed when you're not expecting anything in return. A bit like Moe serving as Robert's wingman by deflecting Maybelline from him all those years ago without bringing it up again. The Block is Hot During an unseasonal heat wave, Uncle Ruckus calls the police on Riley, who's spraying people with a fire hydrant. The police arrive and begin to beat Ruckus, attracting a large amount of media attention to the neighborhood, which Jasmine exploits to draw more business to her lemonade stand. This new attention includes the eye of Ed Wunzler, who buys a stake in her stand in exchange for a pony, though Jasmine will have to work for a while longer to ever see that pony. Now incorporated into Wunzler's business umbrella, Jasmine has to work herself to exhaustion, as Wunzler makes more and more demands to optimize her business, including capitalizing on the story that Uncle Ruckus turned down a police settlement to become an officer himself. But Huey, upset with the clear exploitation, arrives with a group of child labor protesters, and despite these protesters not doing much in the way of effective protest, Wunzler still announces his new cruelty-free lemonade, shutting down Jasmine's stand as the attention is brought away from her, and destroying the stand as demand for the new product causes a riot. Around the same time, Jasmine learns that her contract with Wunzler never got her any closer than the pony she wanted, and the deal gets called off, just in time for a snowstorm to blow in that ends on the chaos. What starts out as an innocent attempt to raise money for a dream turns into a reversed situation of simply trying and failing to stay afloat, as Jasmine is bought out by Wunzler and then forced to work more for less. It's the type of thing that she buys into hoping to make something more for herself only to end up worse off without realizing. She's told that this is the path to financial success and doesn't question it until the very end when the reality of her poverty is made clear, that no amount of climbing will actually get her out of the hole when the person who put her into that hole in the first place stays rich by keeping her there. This episode draws heavy inspiration from the movie Do the Right Thing, a parallel drawn from a minor issue escalating into a massive skirmish due to the heat making people crazy, as well as more direct comparisons like Huey playing Fight the Power on his boombox or Riley opening the fire hydrant, even though white people have pools. In addition to the more overt references, this episode still has the typical boondocks charm in its portrayal of the police, capitalist structures, and the ineffective methods that people take when addressing the flaws in both of these. The Passion of Reverend Ruckus After a cancer diagnosis and a revelation about white heaven, Uncle Ruckus decides to start his own religion, one about black self-hatred that encourages its followers to pray their blackness away. It starts out small, but his message begins to spread, and after a few days he's able to sell out tickets to a revelation. Robert and Tom buy tickets with the hope of talking Ruckus out of it, and putting a stop to the whole movement, which is bad news for Huey, as he was planning on getting a ride to the prison from Grandad in order to execute a plan to free a wrongfully convicted Black Panther from prison. With no support, Huey eventually goes to his thinking spot and turns to desperate tactics, namely, prayer. As Ruckus dares God to strike him down if he said anything false, a storm comes in and Ruckus is struck by lightning, ending the religious movement then and there, while also causing a blackout that prevents the execution of the Black Panther for long enough that a governor nearby calls it off, as Huey had made a random threat to expose his love affair earlier. The Boondocks' take on sweeping organized religion, from the more overt faith of healers and televangelists to the subdued prayer that the desperate turn to, as with most large-scale religions, it's a grift done by conmen to exploit the faith that's inherent in anyone who hates themselves enough. But rather than taking some deeper introspection to try and solve the issue of why one would be so resentful of their own person, it merely asks them to accept this, to hate oneself, but not to remove the part that you hate about yourself. If people were to become more self-aware in this way, they would never be quite so easy to exploit for personal gain. The more active forms of faith, like the desperation tactics used by Huey, are much harder to exploit as he's made strides to address what he dislikes about the world. Even if he recognizes in some small way that fixing all the injustices that keep him up at night is an impossible task, he can still find some satisfaction in life by at least attempting to make the world a better place. 
so he can rest easy knowing that he at least went down fighting, instead of the much easier to exploit passivity that one sees in Ruckus's followers. Season 2 As much as Season 1 pushed the limits of what was acceptable on television, most Adult Swim shows at the time weren't dissimilar. Most of that late-night programming was intentionally abrasive for various reasons. These ranged from simple shock value to a more active attempt to shake the foundations on which its audience rested their worldview. Season 2 was much more aggressive, for lack of a better word, in its attempts to make a more subversive narrative. Through more overt means, what was once broader social satire became more targeted, because good satire needs to have clear intentionality, and it's best to make sure the people you're making fun of don't always laugh along. But on the production side, very little was changed outside of the animation studio, and even this was minor, as the direction and action scenes was largely unaltered. The Boondocks retained the high standard that it began with, and that's something worth pointing out. Because so many shows struggle in their first seasons, as the showrunners try to figure out what works and what doesn't, shifting character dynamics and plot structures to better fit what translates well to the small screen from the script. It's much more common to see a first season of a TV show that's less refined than what comes afterwards because of this phenomenon. But The Boondocks was a largely successful adaptation of the comic strip, in spite of the few changes that were made to accommodate the longer attention span it would have to hold from its audience. But this doesn't mean that the next season is without change. While the show is still conceptually the same, there's still a greater foundation on which to build, namely that the show now had a reputation and a handful of beloved tertiary characters. As such, The Boondocks was no longer trying to make a name for itself in the realm of television, but it set out to maintain that name and build off of it. This manifests in episodes that became more referential, as older characters get a chance to be built upon more than they were able to have done so in the first season alone. Or Die Trying Riley and Robert want to watch Soul Plane 2, The Blackjacking, which is exactly what it sounds like. And they drag Jasmine and Huey along, the former was not permitted by her parents to see the film, and the latter thinks that the concept is stupid. Huey's warnings to Jasmine about Grandad's character in the theater quickly prove themselves to be true, as he sneaks in by using Huey to distract the employees with talk of unionizing, has everyone wear trench coats to sneak food inside, and later throws a tantrum about having to butter his own popcorn after paying way too much for it. This tantrum attracts the attention of Uncle Ruckus, who works as an usher at the theater, and he tries to get the family thrown out. Riley and Grandad eventually decide to leave when security gets too rough, leaving Huey, who set out to try to destroy the master of the film, and Jasmine, who has just overcome her anxiety about sneaking in, behind. But before getting in the car, Grandad has a change of heart and turns around to turn himself in, only for the movie theater to shut down due to the employees unionizing, which gets everyone out of trouble, except for Huey who has one last showdown with a nunchaku wielding ruckus. The biggest change from season 1 to season 2 is the new animation studio working on the episodes, so what better way to show this new studio off than by having an episode that largely focuses on action scenes. Shots of Huey taking out the security guards or fighting against Ruckus with old kung fu movie sound effects added in not only show off the new direction the series is taking, but the older influences that got it to this point. The fake movie trailer that starts out the episode likewise combines the more overt satire with this quick cut new style of editing and storyboarding. And the initial messaging of the show pushed is still present as well, taking both sides of the more complex issues and one side of the lesser ones. We've seen before plenty of digs at the contemporary black cinema, rife with negative stereotypes and the audiences that demand more of this type of lowbrow entertainment. But Huey also ends the episode accidentally having his ideology come up against the real world. He encourages the employees of the movie theater to unionize so they aren't quite as humiliated at their jobs, but the episode ends with all of them losing their jobs as a result. Far from being upset with the corporate heads who fired them though, they instead shift the blame onto Huey for getting the idea of labor organized. Tom, Sarah, and Usher While out on a date, Tom and Sarah meet Usher, and Sarah gets excited when the artist comes over to talk to her and take a few pictures together. Tom gets jealous and the two argue on the way home, resulting in Sarah walking home alone. 
he goes to the Freemans for help and ends up making things worse, thrown out and forced to live with them until he can make his peace with his wife. Though from the visits he's getting from Jasmine, it's clear that nobody else is all that interested in having this happen. Except for the Freemans themselves, who want Tom to stand up for himself purely to get him out of their guest room. They hire the services of a pimp named Slickback, who teaches Tom to be more assertive with women by treating them worse, encouraging Tom to slap her if she doesn't listen. Tom is hesitant to actually hit a woman, though, until he learns from a pimp named Slickback's surveillance that she's arranged to meet up with Usher later that day. They head out to stop her, and Tom finally manages to get mad enough to hit Usher, only to learn that Sarah was merely arranging to have Jasmine meet her idol, and Usher's security beats up Tom. There's an irony in this episode about Tom's treatment of Sarah and the way that the different parties assume he should behave. A pimp named Slickback insists that Tom's problem is that he gives his wife too much leeway in her behavior. Many of the other men in this episode repeat a similar mentality, saying they'd never let their girl act that way. So Tom internalizes that he needs to be stricter and that respecting Sarah is the root of their marital issues, ignoring the evidence that their problem stretched back to long before Usher was ever involved. And yet the episode ends with Tom being beaten up over a misunderstanding. There was never an affair, Sarah simply wanted Jasmine to meet her favorite singer, and Tom failed to ask her about this. If he had treated her with a bit more respect and simply tried talking to her, he would have realized that it was just a woman being starstruck and nothing more. But Tom, who's in a relationship, took the advice of a bunch of single men on how to treat women, and this sort of groupthink got him into a worse situation. It's worth mentioning that, for continuity's sake, Tom and Sarah are back together later on, so there was never a risk to their marriage from the outset. Thank you for not snitching. Ed Wunzler and Gin Rummy are breaking into various houses in Woodcrest while arguing over whether Bluetooth headsets are cool or not. These break-ins caused a neighborhood watch to grow more vigilant, demanding that everyone cooperate with the police in their investigations and singling out the Freeman family. But Robert and Riley refuse to talk, so the neighborhood watch arms themselves and sets out to take down the robbers themselves, ultimately catching Ed and Jin, chasing them into Robert's car, Dorothy, which they steal as a getaway vehicle. Despite seeing what happened and being taken by the police for questioning, they still refuse to say anything, to the point that the police intend to charge them with conspiracy. It's not until Ed breaks into the Freeman's house that the truth finally comes out. They were breaking into homes to increase demand for Wunzler security systems, not realizing that the Freemans already owned one. In the end, they agree to bring back Dorothy and everything seems to be back to normal, even if Granddad ousts them to the neighborhood watch afterwards, though they ignored this because the boys are white. The episode ends with Riley's new bike being stolen by the duo as they thank him for not snitching. The movement of not snitching in this episode is a movement informed by the perception that snitching won't fix problems insofar as the police themselves are able but unwilling to fix the issue, that the police are just as likely to punish whoever cooperated with them as they are to punish the person being accused, a bit like a school with a no-tolerance policy for fighting, which encourages people to take matters of justice into their own hands. The Neighborhood Watch has the idea that the police, and Army and National Guard, are forces that will protect them, and that by militarizing themselves and working with the enforcement bodies, they can increase the security of their neighborhood. But this too is also viewed as something reactionary. Most instantaneous justice is done in a hot-blooded way. The Neighborhood Watch is prepared to turn their own streets into a war zone under the guise of safety, ironically creating a setting of suspicion and paranoia that makes it more dangerous than ever. And in the end, it's revealed that this was the intention by the people in charge all along. Get people to fear each other and turn on their neighbors. Then you can profit off that fear by selling guns and security systems. Stink Meaner Strikes Back For being especially evil, Stink Meaner, the blind old man Grandad killed last season, is sent back to Earth to wreak more havoc and get his revenge. He possesses the body of Tom Dubois, causing him to channel Stinkmeaner and feud with anyone and everyone, eventually returning to the Freeman household to get his revenge on Robert Freeman, who's more concerned with a date he set up by catfishing a woman online. But soon, the possessed Tom strapped to Riley's bed is too much of a distraction, and they're forced to come up with a way to exorcise the spirit, calling Uncle Ruckus over to do the deed. He attempts to get the family to simply beat the spirit out of Tom's body, but after several hours of shouting and beating, no progress is made. But the ghost of Ghostface Killa appears before Huey, giving him a message on how to stop the Twitter moment from last season. Peace. 
Huey is able to get Stinkmeaner and Uncle Ruckus to connect over their hatred of rap music, and the spirit is expelled from Tom's body as love overpowers hate. Stinkmuner returns to the narrative can build on the messaging from last season. Whereas we've seen the destruction force that a Twitter moment can have on a person's behavior, we haven't really seen any solution to this phenomenon other than to simply ignore it. But when you want to ignore an issue that the other party insists on bringing up again, coming back from the dead to get revenge, sometimes ignoring the problem can't actually fix anything. But far from stooping to the other guy's level, the best solution is, as Huey discovers, peace. Because the original issue started due to Grandad feeling emasculated and embarrassed about losing a fight to Stinkmeaner. He disliked the guy and had to prove something to get his dignity back. Here, that cycle of revenge continues on the other foot. Clear that using force to solve the issue would only result in another rematch later on down the line. Responding to hate with hate will only result in more of the same, but changing things up and responding with basic kindness, even if it's still a connection made out of a shared dislike of something, can stop escalation, like uniting over the root cause of the argument instead of the person directly in front of you. The Story of Thugnificent Thugnificent, a rapper from the worst neighborhood in Georgia who has worked his way up through record deals, moves into Woodcrest across the street from the Freeman family. But Robert doesn't approve of the new neighbors and refuses to talk to the guy, made worse when he begins having loud parties all night and parking cars on Grandad's lawn. So he goes to the neighborhood council and files a formal complaint about the noise, to which Thugnificent responds by releasing a diss track, F Grandad. Grandad retaliates by releasing his own track on YouTube, causing the conflict to escalate to the point that random teenage fans of Thugnificence begin attacking the elderly in their own hometowns, putting pressure on his record label to put an end to the conflict. Ultimately, it's revealed that Thugnificent was operating on the assumption that Grandad approved of the parties due to Riley forging his signature, and Huey is able to mediate the dispute into a public showing of forgiveness. Just like the episode Grandad's Fight, this episode is about a dispute with another man that repeatedly gets escalated as each participant views themselves as having been personally attacked and then trying to preserve their dignity. And as always, the core problem comes down to a miscommunication. Tom, at one point, is siding with Robert in filing a complaint against the noise, but he goes over to discuss the issue with Thugnificent in person and comes away no longer enraged by the situation. But Grandad constantly rebukes opportunities to take the high road. Even from the beginning of the episode, he's not willing to go over to greet the new guy. Ultimately, it comes down to the mentality of certain characters. Grandad gets called out for hating throughout the episode, something that he does less out of a reaction and more proactively instead. He hates Thugnificent from the moment he comes into the neighborhood, and never bothers to make an attempt to get to know the guy, completely unaware of the irony in that he himself was poorly received upon coming to Woodcrest for the first time as well. By season 2, Grandad considers himself as much a part of the upper class as anyone else, and he starts to forget where he came from, resenting others who are going through the same struggles he once overcame. Attack of the Killer Kung Fu Wolf Lady Why can I say this is gonna end up on YouTube? After several failed attempts at online dating, Grandad finally gets to meet with Luna, excited because for once, he wasn't catfished by looks. But when Luna comes over to the house for the weekend, she proves Riley and Huey's suspicions about her right when she starts to talk about her past and experiences a white lotus karate master and her pack of wolves. After Huey tests her and gets beaten up, they decide to lie to get her out of the house. The lie fools Luna, but not her friend Nicole, who encourages the girl to go back and stalk Robert for a while, where she hears him call her crazy, the real reason he kicked her out. To prove she isn't insane, she kidnaps Robert and locks the kids in their room, later kidnapping Tom as well when he responds to a preemptive distress call from Huey and prepares to blow them up. But they talk her out of this after hearing her sad backstory about all the abusive men in her life and she leaves, only for Nicole to encourage her to blow up anyway. Two characters who both have had long struggles with their relationships meet in this episode, Grandad and Luna, and despite their relationship struggles coming from different places, the overall message remains the same. If everyone you meet has some kind of issue, consider that the problem might be you. Grandad only dates attractive women, or at least those with attractive profile pictures, and as a result never succeeds in finding someone who he can truly get along with. Meanwhile, Luna is repeatedly in and out of relationships with men who treat her poorly, being attracted to the same mistakes she's been making since she was a teenager. 
When the exact same approach keeps failing again and again, it's time to change things up. To take responsibility often means taking a closer look at the mistakes and figuring out why you're making them, rather than simply complaining that they're being made. Granddad complains about all the women he meets not living up to his standards, only to prove this by trying to kick Luna out instead of respecting her enough to talk her out of the issue. And Luna complains about people viewing her as crazy, only to prove them right through kidnappings instead of trying to prove the accusations wrong. Shinin After being impressed by Thugnificent's house, Riley decides he wants to join the crew himself. He's tested on his abilities, including a test of agreeableness, courage, and procurement of woman, and manages to impress Lethal Interjection enough that they accept him as one of their own, bestowing onto Riley a chain to represent his membership. He celebrates the chain for a short time though, as soon after he's sucker punched and robbed by the local bully, Butch Magnus. So Riley gets advice from Huey, who tells him the chain is only as valuable as whatever he's willing to do to get it back, and Grandad, who encourages him to retrieve it no matter the cost. Riley attempts to fight for the chain, but gets beaten up, and soon the theft of a member of the Lethal Interjection crew is made public. The rest of the gang confronts Riley about this, stating that the entire point of a crew was that you didn't have to do things yourself. They set out to retrieve the chain, though Butch overpowers Riley's backup, only returning it voluntarily after discovering that the metal it was made from was worthless. Ordinarily, status is meant to represent something, typically power, and is used as a shorthand for whatever it's a representation of. In this case, Riley wants the status as a member of Lethal Interjection, with no regard for what it really means to be a member of a crew of this kind. He likes the crew, as he likes the idea of this strength and prestige in numbers, but doesn't want to be considered a weak link by having to call on those numbers to defend what's valuable to them. It's a common saying that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and any competent group of people would be aware of this, so it's natural to assume that the rest of Lethal Interjection would have intervened to defend their newest member. Of course, this differs from the reality of the situation, in which Riley confronts his bully with backup and immediately sees that backup get his leg smashed. The only reason he's able to get the chain back is because Butch voluntarily surrenders it due to the chain having no value to him. It's worthless metal, and it doesn't actually represent a group of people willing to defend him. And in an ironic twist, Riley doesn't value this either as he winds up accepting the chain back at the end of the episode, despite having seen proof that the backup he requested was not as tough as it ought to have been. It's a symbol of nothing, but as long as he ignores this fact and fails to learn the lesson, Riley can still pretend otherwise. Ballin Riley, dreaming of being a professional basketball icon, is getting a lesson in fundamentals from Grandad only to impress Tom, who's coaching a youth basketball league. He's given a spot on the team and it immediately goes to his head, with Riley making demands through his agent Robert and refusing to go to practice. But this backfires when he plays in his first game and fails to do anything but a few impressive dribbles. He rallies with the rest of the team afterwards, helping Tom to live his dream of reenacting the ending to the Mighty Ducks, and learning how to pass to greater success, though his showboating still gets his team into trouble. In their next game, the team goes up against Cindy McPherson, who outplays Riley to the point that they have to use increasingly personal taunts to get into her head and turn the game around. In the final quarter, when their victory seems assured, the opposing team subs in an autistic player, assuming they've already lost, but this autistic child turns out to be a prodigy, winning in such a convincing way that he ends up becoming a celebrity and selling movie rights. The Boondocks is a show that repeatedly makes criticisms of black culture, and a large number of these criticisms come from a place of resentment for the over-commercialization of these aspects of that culture. Basketball here is shown as a black sport, a direct result of the accessibility of the sport to inner-city kids due to the way cities are constructed, but rather than the sport being a means of building communities and fostering teamwork, it's instead viewed as a way to make money and become famous, which Riley dreams about. So as he proceeds to miss this point, he fails to do little more than show off, and winds up looking worse, a poser of sorts, interested in the commercialized aspects of the sport, with none of the original intention or knowledge of how it became popular in the first place. And yet it's not merely the origins of team sports that Riley fails to pick up on, but the later commercialization that he's internalized so much as well. At the end of the episode, Riley's team gets one-upped by an autistic child who gets a movie deal out of the legendary status of the game. 
because this commercialization is rarely about the actual best players, but the players with the best story, it's not a simple competition to see who the most talented players are, but a whole story about these players that's sold to the audience. The most famous people are the ones who sell a good narrative with their victories, whether it's about being the greatest of all time, or having overcome some marketable hardship. Invasion of the Katrinians After hearing about the damage done by Hurricane Katrina, Robert laments the sorry state of what's going on down south, though his actions don't match his words as he tries repeatedly to ghost Jericho Freeman, a second cousin from Louisiana, before the guy ultimately invites himself over and guilt trips Grandad into letting them stay. Tensions quickly rise as the cousins mooch off of their food, electricity, and hospitality, and despite Jericho insisting that he'll pay back everything he's using once his disaster relief check arrives, Grandad still grows tired of waiting, and cuts off power and water himself. But the Dubois family covers for the Freemans on the word from a local news story about J Robert's generosity, putting him in a tougher situation. Despite trying to wear out one another, Huey's eventually able to convince Jericho to return to his home to help rebuild, though in reality he only left because he finally got his check. Robert's sympathy for the victims of Hurricane Katrina is meant to reflect the general American sentiment towards those people, stating that they want to do whatever they can to help short of actually doing anything. When it comes time to help another person out, he's slow to actually accept any responsibility and needs to be gilded multiple times to actually do the right thing. But it's not as though the right thing is easy to do when the people you're trying to help don't do much to make it easy to help them. Jericho and his family simply want a place to stay after their home was destroyed. A simple enough motivation, though their personalities are what come into conflict with the inherent selfishness of the Freemans. This plot almost feels like it's from a morality tale of a family eager to help out their fellow man, the way it's represented in-universe by the news reports, only to slowly be driven mad by their constantly increasing selfish behavior as they wonder at what point they need to cut off aid. But Robert wanted to cut them loose from the beginning, and in the end, misses out on his share of the FEMO relief check, though it's not as though Jericho ever intended on actually paying his cousin back. Home Alone After growing sick of taking care of his grandkids, Grandad vents to Tom, who suggests that the two do it big in Costa Rica. Grandad decides to go alone as he thinks Tom is too lame to make good company, and he has Uncle Ruck his babysit as he's unable to find any other babysitter who can handle the job. But Huey and Riley drive Ruckus out of the house and live together for the two weeks, with Huey putting himself in charge as he's older, only for Riley to spend all the food money on new clothes. Huey reacts by grounding Riley, depicted as a struggle between a prisoner and his captor, while they ration out food and eventually shoot one another with airsoft guns. Meanwhile, Grandad is struggling to enjoy his vacation, as women aren't as attracted to him as he'd hoped, and he mostly spends the time alone in his room. After this disappointment, he turns around and heads home where an angry Tom greets him, admonishing the guy for leaving in Costa Rica without him. But Grandad, having only been gone for two days, lies about his whereabouts, and is ultimately happy to see his family once again. This is an episode that plays with character dynamics by removing one person from a group selectively to allow the characters to react to the new situation. Huey and Riley have worked together many times before, but always under some sort of surveillance from Grandad, who either assists them with advice of his own, making or forbidding more far-fetched ideas. Likewise, Grandad resents spending his old age babysitting two kids, and plans on living it up by himself once more. But he's given a rude awakening, as he realizes that he would waste his old age regardless of whether the kids are around. Huey and Riley have nothing to do with his stagnation in life, and it's a more personal internal fault. A fault that Tom himself is yet to notice. Grandad acknowledges that the guy is boring, assuming that he himself is not, and he tries to leave the other guy behind. However, as he sits around Costa Rica doing nothing, Robert notices that he's no different than his perception of Tom, and as he's learning about these false perceptions, he also concludes that his perception of his grandkids, that they're holding him back, is also inaccurate. The S-Word The episode begins with a media controversy regarding Riley's teacher, Mr. Petto, calling him the N-word. Riley appears broken up over the term in interviews with the station, but he and Grandad are celebrating behind the scenes about their imminent paycheck from the discrimination suit, despite Huey's warnings that suing a public school isn't likely to result in a big payout. 
When Tom comes in as their lawyer and corroborates this claim, Grandad calls a press conference which is commandeered by Rollo Goodlove, who starts to promote his upcoming sitcom using the suit as a platform and eventually coming to a public feud against Ann Coulter. Their pundit fight continues for several days as Grandad wonders when he's going to get paid, only to learn that he's not, because Rollo and Ann are both in on it and merely self-promoting through the whole incident. In the end, Grandad drops the suit just as some fake protesters Rollo hires gets shot at by a Second Amendment group, something that Grandad has mixed feelings about being involved in. Robert and Riley set up a grift in their usual style, this one being based on an exploitation of people's willingness to do the right thing, or at least to attempt to. Naturally, being at the receiving end of a racist rant is a bad thing, and some sort of action to prevent such a thing is a necessary aspect of justice, but this grift is based on not an actual wrongdoing, but merely the appearance of one. Riley feels no actual pain, and Robert only invokes the civil rights movement for his own benefit. Their hope is to exploit the guilty consciousness of everyone else involved in the incident in order to cash a check. But to their annoyance, practically nobody involved has any actual concern with justice, just as they aren't. The teacher, Mr. Petto, isn't actually a bigot, just a guy caught up in Riley's behavior. The school likewise wants to make some sort of restitution, less out of a sense of justice, and more so to silence the complaints before they get too big. But these complaints spiral out of control as they capture more and more attention from people hoping to self-promote. By the time Rollo and Anne get involved in the story, it's far too late for any sense of justice to be performed. By now, it's just a bunch of people gathering attention for the sake of attention, rather than anything else. The Story of Catcher Freeman the story starts with Grandad telling Huey and Riley the tale of Catcher Freeman, a mythical figure who freed slaves from plantations. It also introduces Tobias, a treacherous house slave who cares more about selling his script, despite movies not existing yet, than anything the rest of the slaves care about. He's in love with Thelma, though like the others, she's more concerned with finding a way to freedom from the tyranny of Massa Colonel, rather than reciprocating his feelings. But after Catcher arrives and frees the plantation, Uncle Ruckus enters and claims the story is false, giving his own version of events. In Uncle Ruckus's version, Catch A Freeman is a slave hunter, tracking down escaped slaves on behalf of the plantation owners. In this version, Thelma seduces and distracts him while the escape attempt occurs, with the masters being gunned down alongside Tobias. Finally, Huey solves the incident by simply looking up the story online. As it turns out, Catcher Freeman was actually Tobias, the illegitimate son of the colonel, who tried to sell out a slave revolt to sell his script, but ended up caught in the middle of the fighting, where he killed the colonel by mistake, and simply went along with it. The episode then ends before Riley gets to tell his own version of the story. Naturally, as a result of plantation slaves seldom being taught to read or write, properly written histories of the time period are hard to come by, with many primary sources being things written after the fact and by people motivated to tell their biased side of the story. Whether it's a more daring version of events to make the heroes and villains appear more distinct, or a version that completely flips the dynamics, in the interest of creating a posthumous version of events that makes a future grip look better or worse. The hardest part of history is trying to find sources that are accurate by reading between the lines of what each group is saying and understanding that certain dated historical perspectives contain the version of events that people who lived through them can tell. So to navigate murky waters without getting political, The Boondocks tells a fictional story of a slave rebellion through a Rashomon-style series of recountings. Each person telling the story is so blatantly biased that one can find the truth exclusively between the lines, solely through subtext and ignoring the biases that the teller includes. So in the end, Huey's version of events winds up being the least interesting middle ground between the two far-fetched stories, as it's the only version of events not trying to push a particular narrative. The Story of Gangstalicious Part 2 Gangstalicious releases a new song, Homies Over Hoes, about ignoring women to do the homie instead. Huey recognizes the song for the closeted message it is but Riley refuses to acknowledge the subtext and continues to support his favorite artist, including wearing his newly released clothing line despite the skimpy nature of the outfit. He even coordinates a remix between Lethal Interjection and Gangsta Delicious, as the former group's single isn't as popular as they'd hoped for. But when one of the women Gangsta Delicious turned away writes a tell-all book about his homosexuality, the entire industry turns on him, including Lethal Interjection, and he soon loses his whole career. But Riley asks for the truth out of him, only to get a comforting lie instead that he accepts. 
Meanwhile, Grandad is concerned about Riley's new affectations and style, and tries to turn to Uncle Ruckus for emotional support, eventually accepting his grandson's coming out. Decades after this episode came out, the discussion around LGBT acceptance in hip-hop and music in general is a completely different conversation. While there will always be a few holdouts, they're now fewer and further apart, with most people accepting gay artists as they judge creatives for their musical output instead of personality. Though it's not as though personality doesn't still play a role. In fact, it's still just as much a selling point as it's always been. Part of the reason why Gang's Delicious and artists like him lose favorability when their credibility takes a hit due to attacks from shows about music. Everybody was willing to accept Gangsta Delicious as the biggest name in rap in-universe when his music was taken at face value, but when the name behind the music carries so much weight, some struggle to separate the message from the messenger. And while this is a typical way to partake in consumption of any media work in a more critical way, even this video talks about Aaron Magruder before his work, it also means that anything that happens to one happens to the other, whether it's a person being viewed as less favorable because their music isn't selling anymore, or vice versa. The Hunger Strike Huey goes on a hunger strike, demanding that the BET network goes off the air and its executives commit seppuku before he eats again. These executives are portrayed as a corrupt group of villains, taking a card from Austin Powers' Dr. Evil as they plot to destroy all black people through America with their programming. Huey finds no support in his strike from Riley or Granddad, but he does get the support of Rollo Goodlove who despite voicing his support still takes every opportunity to gorge himself in front of Huey if he's not promoting himself. Huey's hunger strike continues on as BET plots to destroy him, looking for allies where they find, among Uncle Ruckus, Rollo Goodlove. They offer him a show of his own in exchange for the strike being called off without asking for Huey's input. In the end, Rollo tries to convince Huey that this was a victory, but he refuses to participate in the charade any longer, going home to ask Grandad for advice. Huey, and by extension the showrunners, takes on BET, being portrayed as the worst possible thing to happen to black people since Jim Crow ended, pinning all of the perceived degradation of his culture on a single entity, and then protesting by himself to get that entity shut down. Naturally, one person cannot create a significant amount of change on his own, and attempting to do so is a poor idea. But as Grandad says in response, when you can't do nothing, but there's nothing you can do, you do what you can. It's better to at least try to do something positive for your community than it is to simply accept the wrongdoing in the world while acting helpless. These attempts were ultimately doomed to fail from the beginning, just as they were in real life. Later syndicated runs and streaming platform hostings of the Boondocks would not include this episode as, just like in the narrative, the higher-ups at BET didn't like being defamed in such a way and worked to keep the dissenting opinions down. This was the second major incident that threatened the standing of the Boondocks, but fortunately not the last. It's hard to keep righteous people down as long as there are causes worth caring about. The only difficulty lies in trying to find enough people to care. The Uncle Ruckus Reality Show BET gives Uncle Ruckus his own show as they view it as the most destructive thing they could do to the black community. It consists of a camera crew following him around as he goes on racist rants and works at one of his 32 jobs, where he talks about how much he loves white folks. But after an encounter with Tom where they discuss ancestry, Uncle Ruckus decides to get his DNA tested. But when he learns that he's 102% African with a 2% margin of error, he goes into a slump, which doesn't make for very good television, so the BET executive in charge of the show personally arrives to make sure that Ruckus gets out of this slump something he eventually does by torturing the doctor in charge of the test, so he'll redo the results. Now convinced he's white again, Uncle Ruckus goes back to hating black people, despite his self-confessed noob-found empathy. There really was an attempt made at producing a spin-off movie starring Uncle Ruckus at one point, simply titled The Uncle Ruckus Movie. It was meant to be a live-action imagining of the Ruckus family that has, as of now, remained unseen. But the Kickstarter meant to rally funding was unsuccessful, and the project, either fortunately or unfortunately, did not go through. It's interesting to note that, should any spin-off be made, that one covering a side character in this way would be the project to go through. Interesting, though not surprising. Because at its core, The Boondocks is a show that's hypercritical of the worst aspects of black culture, and, and who else is better at this criticality than Uncle Ruckus, a character who simultaneously embodies the sort of crabs-in-a-bucket mentality that drags so many others down, while also spouting right-wing talking points that push so many others down. As if he's dragging others to his level, and pretending that he's one of the people at the top. 
This episode has Ruckus take a DNA test to confront his pigmentation that results in pouting about, giving up on any form of self-improvement as he's internalized so many of the things he himself has been saying. But it's not as though his life as a black man or a white man were all that different. He worked menial jobs and lived in a shack while believing his life was great because of the color of his skin, only to turn about and sulk about these same conditions when the truth briefly came about. Season 3 Very little changed behind the scenes from Season 2 to Season 3, much in the same way that not much was changed between Seasons 1 and 2. However, this time there was much less to build on as Season 2 did, with the new novelty of plots based on characters instead of phenomenon being an established direction to move in by now, resulting in the two seasons being almost indistinguishable aside from the bump in animation, especially in the theme song, which is also slightly remixed yet again. Season 3 takes on a few new groups that Season 2 and 1 did, largely as a result of the new targets for satire that have appeared. Most obviously, Season 3 is the first season to air while the President of the United States was black, and has plenty to say about how little there is to say about that. That Boondocks was always a series that was willing to poke fun at the culture in which it was written, even from the days that it was being published in newspapers. However, a newspaper comic has the advantage of being published alongside the current events of the time, meaning that whatever social issue it lampoons is likely something in the mind of its readers. But television and syndication lasts forever, so it has the obstacle of needing to be current for years. As a result, only the big issues can be covered by the boondocks on television, the biggest change between the two mediums it has been presented in. It's a black president, Huey Freeman. This episode is a documentary-style look at the days leading up to the presidential election and inauguration of Barack Obama, following the black characters of the boondocks as they react to various bits of news regarding the state of the campaign. Robert starts out viewing Obama as a fellow civil rights leader, until realizing that his upper-class lifestyle puts him in range of the tax hikes and that he wasn't invited to the inauguration. Riley thinks he'll be able to get away with everything and anything following the election, but learns that Obama works with the feds and changes his mind. Tom starts to worry that Sarah's obsession with Obama is less political and more sexual. Thugnificent hops on the bandwagon for self-promotion, but drops out of politics when it's obvious he has no idea what he's talking about. Uncle Ruckus and Huey find an unlikely union, when Huey's indifference and Ruckus's hatred wind them onto the same path of trying to leave the country, though Ruckus is arrested and Huey can't get a ride. There was a prevailing idea that as soon as a black man became president, all racial inequality would immediately dissipate, and this was something parroted from both sides. Even the most racist among Americans would argue that the country couldn't discriminate because we had a black president, and therefore any complaints about unequal treatment or systemic inequalities were dismissed. And naturally, there were also those who viewed the idea of eliminating racial inequalities as a bad thing in and of itself, as Ruckus does, going so far as to create a hypothetical situation where the discrimination would surely be reversed something Riley wholeheartedly agrees with, though he's always been a stereotype himself. There was a fear that, if we had a black president, then black people would start to treat white people the same way white people have been treating black people for years. But as Huey observes, none of this happened. Any presidential candidate working with a political party, so anyone with a chance of winning, is going to have views that align with whatever their party wants. Factually, the difference in policy between a candidate like Obama or Hillary Clinton is very minor. So minor that historically there wouldn't have been much of a change. As it turns out, the position of president isn't nearly as consequential as so many believe it is in anything but culture and the ranting of political pundits. Riches to Rags Again, YouTube. The episode starts with Thugnificent hiding from tax collectors and the repo man, who takes his car while he has Riley over, though the former artist insists that everything is fine as he's going to drop a new record soon. But due to a combination of the overuse of autotune, the fact that he doesn't realize he's outdated, and some poorly planned beef with another younger artist, his album flops. So Thugnificent, now Otis Jenkins, tries to find work with Flo Nominal, a former member of Lethal Interjection, who encourages him to move on. But Otis's discussion of his past only results in both men getting fired from their job, so he resorts to the drug game instead, though he fails at this as well as people recognizing him on the streets peddling bad product. Eventually, Otis finds a rebuttal to his insults from the artist he insulted, claiming that the guy he used to look up to but no longer does, and the last of his possessions are confiscated by the IRS. 
After one last attempt at getting back into the game is ruined by Ed Wensler Jr., who confused the meeting with a drug deal, Otis resigns from his career as a musician to try to make reality television instead. Otis Jenkins, or Thugnificent, loses his career in this episode and goes through the process of grief by following the well-known five stages. First is denial. He doesn't accept that he's failing as an artist and even lies to those closest to him about his lack of money. Next is anger. He starts insulting others who have what he can't. Then bargaining. He tries desperately to find some new ways to make money and stay in the game. Then depression as he sulks about with nothing to motivate him any longer. Finally, acceptance. Otis Jenkins lands on his feet, working a much worse job than before, but at least trying to climb to the top as he records his daily lives in the hopes of making a show about it. And though it's implied that he won't find any success as a UPS driver, the fact that he at least has his optimism back is a good sign for his mental health, if not his career. Just as quickly as Thugnificent's career starts, it ends as well, though not instantly nor as steadily as one would expect. We finally get some additional backstory to him insofar as his motivations for wanting to rap in the first place. It wasn't just that he was hoping to get out of Terra Bell, but that he had a genuine passion for music. And like Phenomenal says, they got to follow their dream. But as time went on, that dream was forgotten about. Otis was no longer in the ghetto he was working so hard to escape, and so his only motivation ceased to exist. It's fitting that he never found any satisfaction in his life until after he finally broke down and admitted what he wanted to be in the first place, a musician. The Red Ball Long Do, a Chinese business rival of Ed Wensler I, calls in some debts, resulting in Ed betting the entire town of Woodcrest on a kickball game. Both Ed and Long hire crack teams of elite players, but Eds are all deported or otherwise busy on the day of the game, resulting in their only good player being Huey, who's only begrudgingly come out of retirement after being guilt-tripped for injuring a young girl in a game he was bribed to throw. The game begins, but the last-minute ringers for the American team don't stand up to the elite Chinese players or their bribery of the judges, and the score is heavily in China's favor. But after overhearing the other players making fun of him and having the corrupt judge replaced by the unbribable Uncle Ruckus, Huey decides to step up his game by simply injuring the entire Chinese team. They fight back, literally, by attacking the Americans until Huey and Ming are the only two players left, injuring one another in a final play before Huey ultimately manages a Fyrick victory, though it's one the injured Americans celebrate anyway. Ed Wunzler and Long Do are two bitter financial rivals from opposite sides of the world, one who allow their rivalry to spread into the lives of the people who they rule over. If Ed Wunzler loses a few billion dollars, it's implied at the beginning of the same episode, he'll simply get a corporate bailout and be right back on his feet. And if a few Chinese athletes have had their lives ruined to train and kickball their whole lives, that doesn't harm Long Do's bottom line. This episode ultimately portrays the conflicts of the ultra-wealthy as trivial to the people who started them, while being devastating to the foot soldiers whose livelihoods are at stake, whether they win or lose. But the more obvious reference this episode makes is to the Samurai Champloo episode Baseball Blues, down to the finale of rivals from two opposing countries settling the game through acts of violence that result in a near double knockout. The Boondocks as a show makes no secret about its inspirations, the fact that it pulls heavily from Japanese animes from style to animation to the way plots resolve. Aaron Magruder is a confirmed weeaboo, not that I'm any less guilty, though this is something that doesn't come about as often in his earlier works as borrowing from the East tends to get fewer people understanding the reference. Stinkmeaner 3, The Hateocracy the episode starts with a lesson on Twitter moments, that they can bring people together with ignorance as much as tearing them apart, and when these two forces meet, they result in a complete disaster. At this, the Hateocracy, three of Stinkmeaner's associates, converge on Woodcrest to get their revenge against Grandad's for his actions two seasons ago. They start by splitting up to ambush Huey and Riley at school, only getting saved by the bell, while Grandad's attacked while fishing, barely escaping into the water. Knowing they're being hunted, the Freeman family pays for the services of Bushido Brown to protect them, but he has hefty fees for his services, and Robert loses too much money retaining him. But when Bushido Brown gets fired, the Hatocracy arrives, and Robert Freeman desperately rehires the Karate Man, though he only survives for a short time before being beheaded. So Grandad resorts to the extreme measure of apologizing for killing Stinkmeaner before, only for the Hatocracy to admit that they never cared about the guy and simply wanted someone's life to ruin. In the end, it's not fighting back or making peace that ends the conflict, but the police showing up to arrest the aggressors. 
The first season gave us Grandad fighting over hatred, with the next season giving us Grandad fighting with love. Here, in Season 3, there's a new perspective given to events, one that posits that some issues can't be fixed by ignoring them or finding middle ground. Some people just hate, and nothing you can do will prevent that. And while calling the police has always been seen as an extreme step, snitching, sometimes getting a higher power involved is all you can do when there's no available high road. Because the hatred of the hatocracy truly is random. They have no real motivation to defend Stinkmeaner's memory, as Huey theorized they did. He believed that Grandad fighting caused some sort of cycle of revenge, when the reality is that it was simply a group of people who loved to hate. You can't break a cycle that's not there, one where the hating comes about in a random fashion. And while the first season's solution of simply waiting for them to find a new target to hate may have worked, the risk of losing your life before that happens is still far too high to overlook. Smokin' with Cigarettes The episode begins with a new story about Lamilton to Sean, a local youth who gained some notoriety by stealing his grandmother's car and going for a joyride. Back in the present, he convinces Riley to go along with him on another ride where they get into a police chase, smoke with cigarettes, and wind up destroying the car in a parking lot. Riley gets in trouble, but is undisturbed until Lamilton starts doing worse and worse things, feeling less and less remorse. Eventually, he steals his grandmother's gun and shoots the neighbor's dog with it. Riley starts to regret spending so much time with the guy, but can't cut off the relationship as he's threatened into compliance every time. Around this time, a Dr. Dumas goes to the Freeman's house to warn them about Lamilton, who he's been following for some time, only for the two to learn that he's out with Riley. They rush over there where the two are scuffling on the roof, with their fight knocking Lamilton to the edge. Riley tries to save him, but Dumas rushes over to push him down, chasing the kid to the ground to finish him off for good. Lamilton LaShawn is a not-so-subtle parody of the real story of Latarian Milton, a seven-year-old who took the family car for a joyride and was quoted in an interview to have said many of the same lines as Lamilton in the universe. The overall plot much more closely resembles the movie Juice, with a similar hostage-esque situation occurring. The message itself comes down to the ways in which this sort of behavior is fostered, then encouraged, then mistreated to make a disastrous situation, where young kids idolize criminal lifestyles without understanding anything about the necessity that drove so many of those acts, or the level of empathy to understand why what they're doing is wrong in the first place. Lamilton was a bad kid, no doubt as a result of his grandmother's coddling as she continues to justify and cover up his behavior while insisting he's done nothing wrong. Then, people like Riley come along and ride his coattails in the hopes that they too can create a reputation of this sort of behavior to look cool. Finally, the system that tries and fails to punish miscreants like Lamilton end up torn between systemic indifference to their crimes or an obsession with punishment, but only after the harm has been done, rather than any genuine attempt at prevention. The Fundraiser Tired of being treated like a loser by his granddad, Riley decides to make his own money by selling candy bars, competing with the charity fundraiser his school has been putting on. Huey tells him that this is a bad idea, but Riley refuses to hear his spoilers about the ending. He recruits the school's top pushers and some hired muscle in Cindy, as he establishes his business plan of keeping the money instead of donating it. Young Reezy's fake charity struggles to make any sales as the world's ultimate charity already has a monopoly, so Riley decides to buy out their salesmen by offering a bigger cut, the cost of doing business. This cost of doing business continues to ramp up as he pays off the school principal, then multiple other districts, and eventually expands his business to nearby schools as well as moving operations to a hotel. Huey is still concerned, but Grandad's been paid off with a car that turns into a boat, though this vehicle gets car-bombed shortly after a threat from World's Ultimate Chocolate, and Riley heads out to shut down the operation. But before he gets the chance to, he's confronted by the Charity, who are confronted by the Mafia, who are confronted by SWAT. In the end, Riley goes back to his own life, not having learned his lesson, despite Huey's bulletproof vest saving his life. Riley's obsession with gangster movies also comes with an ignorance to the message of many of these films. While the first halves always show a character's rise to power and mass accumulation of wealth, these are always stories about hubris and the inevitable fall of anyone selfish enough to commit the crimes needed to get to that point. But Riley fixates on the wealth and declares that he knows better than the fictionalized versions of real figures, stating that it will be different this time despite Huey already prepared to tell him how the story ends, but when does Riley ever listen to his advice or input anyway? 
But it's not only Riley who wants to get rich quick. His entire empire is built on the backs of other people willing to do the same thing. He recruits people by appealing to their sense of greed and offering them a bigger cut, then bribes anyone official to look the other way as he operates under their noses. Even his granddad's concerns for his well-being can be stuffed with enough cash to get him to look the other way. It's not until bigger players come into the game, all wanting a piece of the action for themselves, that Riley finally realizes that any industry built on greed will be collapsed by the same notion. Pause. Hoping to get a movie career before it's too late, Grandad signs up for an audition with Winston Jerome, who is looking for a leading band for his upcoming play. But Huey and Riley warn him about the context of Winston's movies. They all have the same lowbrow plot and are just excuses for the leading man to cross-dress. This is confirmed in a musical number the guy has upon Grandad as he joins in, which the chorus confesses that it's acceptable to cross-dress if it's for Jesus, and that the Lord himself mandated that he find oily, light-skinned black guys to spread the word. But when Grandad, lured in by the promise of unlimited woman, starts neglecting his family in favor of his new family, Huey and Riley rush in to save him from making out with the man in drag. But Grandad reaffirms that he's willing to do anything to make it in Hollywood, at least until Winston Jerome reveals that his entire reason for getting into the business was to have men to sleep with, at which point Grandad retires. As he drives home, he repeatedly has Riley pause his performance, waiting to hear him say no homo. Winston Jerome was a not-so-subtle parody of Tyler Perry, from his by-the-numbers movie formula to the perceived homosexual tendencies at the episode Lampoons. The real Tyler Perry was purportedly furious with his depiction in the boondocks, though he's never officially commented on the episode. Despite this, he did contact the network behind the scenes and claimed that he was putting considerable thought into his relationship with them moving forward. But the episode itself isn't purely about Perry, though. It pulls more from the cultish behaviors of the organized religions and the ways in which they find desperate people to pull away from their homes and connections in the interests of exploiting them for the personal gain of the group's leadership. In this episode, these gains are made in the form of covering up and exercising homosexual activities in a way that almost comes across as homophobic. Though for a show that's also had episodes, like The Story of Gang's Delicious Part 2, that touch on the inherent illogical behavior behind homophobia, it's also more likely that the message is about the hypocrisy of a closeted religious individual than whatever's hiding out in the closet in the first place. A Date with the Booty Warrior Robert attends a group therapy session for men who are afraid of prison relations and over several weeks is able to overcome his fear. To prove this to himself, and to make the first step in becoming a defense attorney to save others from the same fate, he decides to chaperone a scared stiff program to a local prison. Among the kids in the program are Huey and Riley, sent there for fighting in school. But when they arrive, the scared stiff program volunteers end up scaring Tom, stripping him to his underwear, where they find a toothbrush that Riley had carved into a shiv that they used in the prison riot. But as the riot progresses, Tom runs away and the rioters realize they don't have a plan. So Huey helps them to organize a committee to make a list of grievances so they can use the hostages they've captured as leverage, though they struggle to organize long enough to make demands for anything other than various colors of woman. Eventually, Robert is able to sneak the white kids out of prison to safety, and when he returns for Huey and Riley, ends up confronting the titular Booty Warrior, who he fights back against with a bar of soap. Eventually, the inmates realize their hostages are gone, and give up on trying to make any changes to the system. The Boondocks shows its criticisms of the prisonal industrial complex during this episode in as plain terms as possible, Huey effectively looking at the camera and defining the systemic destruction of black neighborhoods in the interest of accruing a cheap labor source and maintaining the profitability of for-profit prisons. And of course, this profitability has the end goal of permanent expansion, the same end goal as any organization under a capitalist structure. But what does it mean when prisons are expanding? It means they have to find a growing source of prisoners, much in the same way that a business might try to hire new employees. As such, there's more money in increasing brutal bylaws that keep people on the path to destruction than there is in actual rehabilitation. And this is something that's touched upon earlier in episodes like Smoking with Cigarettes. It costs significantly more time and resources to punish crime than it does to prevent it. But when there's a person who benefits from more spending, there's an incentive to address the issue of criminal activity as late as possible. Social programs that keep people off of drugs and out of gangs cut into the profit margins of the people who own the prisons, so they lobby against that spending as wasteful. 
And all of this ends up dehumanizing the people at the bottom of the social hierarchy, people like the booty warrior and his fellow conspirators, who stop seeing themselves as human after spending so much time in the system. The Story of Lando Freeman while trying to get the boys to do the yard work that Uncle Ruckus has cancelled on many times in a row, another man shows up to do it instead. Impressed by his work ethic, Robert pays the guy well and the two go out to a strip club together. But while they're looking at the girls, they tell each other stories about their upbringing where the man Lando claims that he's really Robert's estranged son. Robert goes to Gin Rummy for help keeping Lando away, and gets a suggestion to take him on the Steve Wilkos show for a DNA test. But when this test confirms that Robert is the father, he decides to try to make peace with the guy, as Romy was planning on killing his son otherwise. It takes some time for the family to warm up to him, but eventually Riley and Lando bond over their trash-talking basketball, while Robert bonds with him when the two taunt Ruckus for losing work. However, the new family is watching Steve Wilkos later, when Huey notices that the DNA test results on the show are all faked. So they call in for the real test, and learn that Lando is not Robert's son after all, but instead the son of Billy D. Williams. Robert Grandad Freeman has always been portrayed as a self-interested man, from his dubious involvement in the civil rights movement in spite of the amount of credit he takes, to his dubious involvement in his grandchildren's lives in spite of the amount of credit he takes for what they do. When one of the boys is doing well for himself, he takes the credit, but when they get in trouble, he shifts the blame. It's not as though this is an aspect of his personality that he would expressly deny, either. Grandad's openly admitted to his shallow expectations in dating before, and has an open disdain for practically everyone who's not him. And this ties into the very reason he disliked Lando Freeman in the first place. The guy made him look bad. Having a son you don't know about and never visit makes you a deadbeat, and thus, the kind of person who would likely show some sort of lack of attachment to anything else important in life. Not to mention that this is a pervasive negative stereotype of black men especially, one that prominent actors like Avery Brooks fought scriptwriters to offset. Yes, I get one Star Trek reference per video. And in this episode, it's a stereotype that Robert Freeman gets labeled as in spite of his insistence that he's done plenty of work fighting against the stereotypes. It's not until Lando proves himself to be a righteous person that Robert finally accepts him as one of his own, but it's this conditional acceptance that also lets him accept the man leaving so suddenly as well. The Lovely Ebony Brown After too many bad relationships, Robert deletes his social media accounts and swears off of woman forever, only to immediately meet Ebony Brown while out jogging. He and the rest of the family are hesitant at first, but Robert tries to take the relationship slowly instead of rushing into things as he always does. A few days pass, and, in spite of Uncle Ruckus' attempts at tearing the couple apart, they find out that Ebony Brown is just as good as she seemed to be, the perfect woman. So Robert, of course, panics. He tries to reinvent himself and eventually resorts to stalking Ebony, where he starts to suspect that she's seeing younger men. After getting into a fight over a perceived slight on her honor, Ebony claims that she needs some space and leaves him. But Riley finds her Twitter account and discovers that she's in Malaysia, so Robert tracks her down to get back together, only to learn that she was only down there to help with typhoon relief and has also only been gone for a few hours. In the end, she tells Robert that his obsession is unhealthy and breaks up with him for his sake. The episode ends with Robert trying to date online once again. Robert has repeatedly struggled to find any amount of romance in his life, and this episode gives a potential reason why. He has always put himself first before anyone else in these relationships, but Robert doesn't love himself as much as he ought to. It's not self-love in the sense that you treat yourself every so often, but self-love in believing that you deserve the treatment. When he finally manages to find a woman who loves him more than he loves himself, he immediately assumes there's a catch that she wanted his money, or that she was going to snap and go crazy like the others have. And so, with this dynamic in play, we get to see the opposite end result of Robert's relationships play out. Rather than the woman turning out to be the crazy one, it's Robert who is crazy. He breaks down emotionally because he's incapable of understanding why anyone would tolerate his presence when he puts so much effort into not being alone with himself, to the point of defining his life through other people's accomplishments and accolades. Even to the point of getting others to go along with it, Uncle Ruckus spends so much time and effort trying to discredit Ebony Brown that he doesn't even consider that the problem in their relationship might actually be Robert instead. Mr. Medicinal When Huey and Riley destroy the TV, Grandad gets so angry that he has a heart attack. So they drag him to the doctor's office, where he has a series of tests run that find nothing majorly wrong with him, except for high stress levels. 
They give him a large box of pills to take to deal with the stress, but when the former rapper Thugnificent delivers them, he offers an alternative way to get stress-free in a joint. Grandad is hesitant due to what he knows about drugs, but takes it anyway and immediately has a much better outlook on life. This concerns his grandkids, who sneak into his bongo time and catch him in the act of smoking, getting arrested as a result. At the trial, he uses the defense of not knowing marijuana was illegal and gets away without punishment. But when he learns that his supplier's been arrested, he stages a public protest. And as this was his second offense, Grandad gets sentenced to house arrest and community service, making an embarrassing PSA. This is one of those episodes that, had common sense prevailed, would have been retrospected upon in the same way that we look at an episode like The Story of Gang's Delicious, where the prevailing ideas of the day become outdated, and we can look at the absurdities of the reactions of the characters as a caricature of past anxieties that never came to fruition. But the conversation around the legalization of marijuana hasn't changed much in some parts of the West, despite the test runs that exposure created. Despite the lack of concrete evidence that the fear-mongering surrounding the legalization argument might have had us believe, the gateway drug of marijuana never truly deserved that label. But that was never the point. Anti-legalization advocates have never been concerned with health or safety or culture. It's always been a talking point to distract from the real reason so many things are illegal. The prison industrial complex needs a steady supply of new prisoners to serve its interests. If certain drugs start to become legalized or even accepted, it starts to raise questions about the level of police funding and surveillance that we subject ourselves to in the interest of snuffing it out. This episode makes the direct comparison between the laid-back high of Grandad under the effects of the substance in question versus the more aggressive and miserable legal intoxication of something like alcohol. The Fried Chicken Flu Oh, I just got chicken flu. A national chicken chain unveils a new spice blend that's hyped up to the nation, including Robert and Riley. But Huey and Jasmine are too busy working on a contingency plan for a vague apocalyptic event to concern themselves with the new product. So Riley and Grandad head to the restaurant, only to wait hours and discover that the chicken has run out. In fact, the chicken has run out everywhere, leading to riots and widespread panic, only exasperated by a new strain of flu dubbed the Fried Chicken Flu that is likewise sweeping the nation. Huey puts his emergency plan into action, though he's had to make some sudden changes as a result of Jasmine coming over and continuously has to accommodate additional guests arriving as Grandad and Riley bring people over as well, including some of the old Lethal Interjection crew who have brought some of the contaminated chicken into the house, getting Tom sick. Between Tom's illness and a mob of neighbors demanding admittance into the house to mooch off of Huey's supplies, they wind up running out of power and getting into a high-speed chase, all of which means they find out too late that the fried chicken flu was really just salmonella. As much as he likes to pretend to be above it all, Huey is just as likely to get caught up in the same paranoia that sweeps the nation in this episode. But rather than condemning him for this, the narrative draws a distinction between his prepping and the panic that seeps into the rest of society by deriving a purpose. Namely, Huey prepares for a disaster and makes a plan to try to save people close to him rather than just himself. And while he acknowledges that it's a bad idea, he ultimately caves to calls to allow more inside, shielded from the presumed chaos of the world at large. While most people are interested in their own survival, Huey is interested in keeping his family safe, giving him the continued moral high ground. But all of this is to say that the entire unfolding of events was unnecessary in the first place, as the truth behind the whole situation was that no danger ever truly presented itself. Fried chicken flu was not the deadly pandemic people thought it was, and the state of disaster was entirely man-made. Ironically, in spite of Obama's hypocrisy in this episode of putting his family in a safe situation and leaving everyone else behind, the hollow words he said would have prevented actual panic. Not getting at each other's throats over the issue would have mitigated so much of the actual harm done. It wasn't the flu we had to worry about, but each other. The Color Ruckus the episode begins with the story of Uncle Ruckus' adoption by his black parents, left on a doorstep by a white family who abandoned him for his re vitiligo. He spent his whole life growing up with a mother who taught him to love white people, and a father who beat him for doing so, as well as a grandmother who was nastier than her father. But when that grandmother shows up at Ruckus' shack to die in his chair, he escapes to the Freeman household so as not to go back, and he gets followed there by his grandmother and the rest of his family. They've all had more or less successful lives, sucking up to white people, but his father still despises them all for this, revealing to Ruckus that he's not adopted and that he was black from the beginning. The real reason for his hatred was because Ruckus's birth tied him to a woman that he hated. 
Eventually, Grandma Ruckus dies, and the brothers work together to dig her grave, briefly making peace within the family before their father shows up to the funeral to tell them off one last time, before suffering a heart attack and falling into the open grave as well. Ruckus's mother immediately marries her white lover, and they all go their separate ways, with Ruckus vowing to pity black folks instead of hating them moving forward. Repeatedly throughout the show, we'll see characters react with kindness when show hatred as having taken the moral high ground, that the only way to contradict hate is with love. And of course, any who ignore this advice will find that they only breed more hate as time goes on. Uncle Ruckus is revealed to have come from a rough background, and yet he ends up the most miserable and nasty of all his siblings, who came from the same conditions, because he grew up internalizing a hatred of himself. His father taught him to hate white people like himself, while his mother taught him to love a part of himself that never physically manifested. So every time Uncle Ruckus looked in the mirror, he only saw what he hated most, even though he told himself otherwise. And yet his brothers turned out alright despite also being raised by a hateful man because they didn't internalize the same message Ruckus did. While their mother never lied about their race, they never ended up with the message of loving white people an exception to anyone else that Ruckus picked up on. As such, they approached the world with a love of whiteness, while Ruckus claimed to do the same thing, but it wasn't that he actually liked white folks, he just hated everyone else. It's possible to put someone up without putting another group down, and doing so can take a person who still internalized a lot of prejudice and have them outwardly okay. It's going down. Anti-terrorist legend Jack Flowers uses enhanced interrogation methods to find the name of a woodcrest from a suspect. So some anti-terrorist agency or whatever converges on the neighborhood, assuming Huey is going to be involved in something big. Huey, meanwhile, is on the run from a warning given to him by White Shadow about the assault, and he kidnaps Uncle Ruckus to force him to drive away. Meanwhile, Ed and Jin have set up a series of explosives underneath Wunzler Plaza downtown with schematics and their plan on Ed's new iPhone. But he drops this phone while waiting on a flat tire to be fixed at the Freeman household. And when the force arrives at the home, it's found. Huey and Ruckus are captured and threatened with interrogation until the force arrives with the real threat. So Flowers is sent to a warehouse full of boxes, while Huey and Ruckus try to evacuate the building, only to find that the only person inside is a security guard. As it turns out, Wunzler planned on blowing up his own building to make a martyr out of the guard and profit off of merchandising. In the end, Huey manages to keep everyone safe while uncovering the conspiracy, and Grandad and Riley point out that he's always been right, though they imply that they're not going to listen to him anyway. Huey regularly buys into conspiracies about big government plans, and that's what this episode is all about. But it also shows the difference in the type of secret government organization ploys and the actual domestic threats that a country is likely to face. Namely, in that whatever disaster happens, it's usually predicated for the benefit of a person in charge, whether that's an insurance company using fears of the disaster to profit, or a hardware store marking off generators before a storm. Here, it's the country's eternal fear of a vague terrorist threat that has everyone worried and prepared to move out, when the reality is that it was simply a billionaire trying to drum up sales for a movement built out of fear. And while in the real world, it's not likely that people would intentionally go to the extremes that a cartoon villain, like Wunzler might, the moral of Ent Horizon is still something they're more than willing to cross by profiting off the disaster. As much as people are afraid of an overseas threat, it's much more likely that any harm that befalls you will be caused directly or indirectly by the people who have direct power over yourself. If a terrorist attack does happen, it's usually a result of government actions that would drive a person to an extremist ideology in the first place, with the occasional attack being considered an acceptable cost for continuing an overseas war. Season 4 Aaron McGruder was not involved in the development of Season 4 due to the fact that, quote, a mutually agreeable production schedule could not be determined. While I don't like to make claims in my videos that a single individual could be that influential in the development of a show, after all, television is such a collaborative medium between storyboarding, artistry, voice acting, and the myriad other contributions, the impact of the original brain behind the concept leaving the show would be much more impactful given the origins of the Boondocks. As such, Season 4 takes the show in a different direction rather than simply trying to follow in the trend set by the seasons with Magruder's involvement. I think this is a positive direction for the show to take as they turned a potential tragedy of a lead leaving and turned it into a chance for a new take on the show. Whether this was successful in creating a better product or not is left up to the viewer's experience, 
though based on reviews left after the season aired, these experiences are overall negative. Pretty Boy Flizzy Tom Dubois is selected to represent Pretty Boy Flizzy, an R&B artist notorious for getting into trouble with the law regularly. But Tom is too distracted with some marital troubles to focus on the case, namely that Sarah is upset with him for lacking a backbone. When Flizzy notices that Tom is too distracted to focus, he decides that, in exchange for working on the case, he'll teach Tom to be more popular with women to get his wife back. Tom accepts, but the lessons on women include ideas that they prefer to be treated poorly and like bad boys, that women would rather be with a guy who beats them than bores them. All these lessons make Tom suspicious that Flizzy and Sarah are sleeping together behind his back, and these combine with the learned knowledge that Flizzy has been faking his crime sprees, resulting in the insecurities flaring at a birthday party for Jasmine where, at Flizzy's insistence, Tom punches him in front of his wife, which she enjoys enough to repair their marriage. The music industry has always been portrayed by the boondocks as being artificial, at least the public sides of it. Some people listen to artists because of the message of their music, and the way they work with melodies to create a cohesive emotional sensation. But the lowbrow among music fans are those who care less about the music and more about the person making it, at least in the modern day. Performance artists have always considered the artists themselves as part of the finished product, but as record labels started to realize that it's much easier to fake a persona than it is to fake talent, this has created a shift in music culture away from the songs themselves and towards the celebrity status of the person behind the music. Pretty Boy Flizzy is a completely fake person, even his criminal activity is falsified to make a persona, and this is something that he is fully aware of. As long as the audience demands it, this is the type of content that will be pushed out, and this audience is portrayed as nearly masochistic in their desire for a creator who they can imagine treats them like dirt. So this episode is not just a condemnation of the music industry, but a condemnation of the people who continue to support the industry that thrives off drama and legal troubles, instead of appreciating the product for what it is. Good Times Robert Freeman announces that he's millions of dollars in debt and that the family may need to move out. Ed Wunzler Jr., a different one, comes by as he's now the manager of Wunzler's properties and starts demanding that Robert make his first payment, but when he misses the one-month deadline, has to make vague threats to get them into a new arrangement. In this arrangement, the Freeman family stays in the garage while each room of the house is rented out to afford the debt payment. This doesn't prove to be enough, and soon, dead bodies are being stored in the garage while Robert tries and fails to hold down a job. Meanwhile, Uncle Ruckus is running as a far-right political candidate and, after an unsuccessful presidential campaign, runs for mayor of Woodcrest. He has a message of bringing back slavery to put black people to use, and uses the debt-ridden Freeman family as a pilot experiment, eventually settling with Wunzler to sign Robert over in exchange for the house. Ed Wunzler II is a loan shark willing to exploit people who have few options. When Robert Freeman goes into debt, he's willing to use a combination of this desperation and vague threats to get the guy to agree to more and more demeaning demands. First, at an interest rate of 21% on a home mortgage, then later a loan with a 150% interest rate, and finally full-on legal slavery. It's not as though any of these steps are a major escalation from the previous one in anything but language, though. Robert has no recourse to defend himself or any options available other than blindly accepting whatever gets put in front of him. A choice between starvation and homelessness or eternal debt isn't much of a choice after all. It's either that or, as Wunzler's assistant says, faking your own death. So much of this episode's developments aren't progressions selected by Robert himself, but rather escalations decided on by the people in power, and thus things outside his control. Despite Robert trying to work his way out of the situation at the car wash, he ends up losing his job due to upper management decisions. Despite trying to raise money through renting out rooms of the house, it's still not enough for the bank that owns the property, despite them being the ones to plan the idea in the first place. The people at the top of the economic ladder are able to make the people at the bottom pay for their mistakes and mismanagement while getting off scot-free most of the time. Breaking Grandad Huey is at work on a chemistry project in the garage that Grandad inquires about, with Huey claiming it's hair gel he's making to cover for the fact that it's a bomb meant for the loan shark Ed Wunzler II, who had them sign over their lives in the last episode. When Grandad puts some in his hair, Huey tells him the truth about it, though these warnings are ignored as the product is also found out to make hair grow straight and quick. They package it as bomb hair gel and sell it to a local beauty salon, making a ton of money in the process but getting the suspicion of the authorities. 
Despite this, demand for the cream still exists, and they get back to work on making a next batch, only for the businesswoman selling the product to hold them at gunpoint and demand the formula. So Huey and Grandad, held at gunpoint while they cook, create an actual bomb to gas their hostage takers and escape. In the end, the van they were cooking in explodes during a failed attempt at hot wiring, and they walk home. In case it wasn't already obvious, this episode borrows most of its plot beats from the first episode of Breaking Bad, down to aesthetic choices like Grandad cooking in an apron and his underwear, or the use of a camper van in the deserts of the American Northeast. As the series has progressed into the fourth season, many of the usual plot beats have shifted away from satire of black culture and into references to pop culture instead. And while there's still a bit of that usual boondocks charm involved in the episode, like pointing out the inherent dangers consumers are willing to put up with in the interest of fashion, these seem to be a secondary focus of the show, rather than primary. But another major shift in tone and style comes from the use of a serialized plotline. The Freeman family loses all their money in the previous episode, and this dynamic persists through this one. And while a sudden shift to serialization isn't unheard of in animation, it's also something that needs to be done with more focus and grace than the implementation here, where it's used as a vehicle for referencing another show, and then forgotten about shortly afterwards. Early Bird Special Trying to solve the family's financial problems from before, Huey suggests that Grandad get a job, though all his attempts fail as he lacks the work ethic of Mexicans. Eventually, they call over Tom Dubois to help brainstorm, and he suggests volunteering at a nursing home to pad his resume. But while there, he meets Geraldine, who reveals herself to be a pimp for escorts, and she's been eyeing Grandad as a potential hire. He sets out on his first days of work in spite of the uneasiness of Huey and Riley, and learns that his job is much more about emotional reassurance than what he had believed. Eventually, one of his clients, Vanessa, moves into the house as part of her deal. She cooks and cleans for him, even straightening out Riley and getting him to read. For a brief moment, he thinks that Vanessa deserves better, and tries to get out of his contract to live with her for real. Despite these negotiations failing, he returns home to find that Uncle Ruckus, on his request from earlier, has found a clingy white woman to drive away his new beau. Continuing with the serialization trend, this episode has Grandad try and fail to get a new job, the first half of the episode being about the exploitation of Hispanic immigrants, legal or not, but then pivoting to a story about male prostitution and the women who hire them. It posits that, while men hire prostitutes for sexual relations, women hire them for emotional support. The most female sex workers will attest to the fact that many men likewise hire women to fill an emotional void in their lives, and they're just as likely to come over to a man's house to be a lap to cry on than anything else. In fact, the rise of parasocial personalities, as one would see on a site like OnlyFans, attests to the similarity in gendered needs. So the ultimate point this episode makes winds up coming down to what is by now a dated perception of consumer demands from sex workers, itself being a subject that doesn't get brought up very often for the obvious reason of people being ashamed to talk about it. Even Riley, at one point, completely changes his mind on Grandad's new job when he learns he's an escort for women instead of men, the same work being done in a slightly different way, receiving a totally different reaction from an observer's point of view. Freedom Ride or Die The episode takes place as a documentary of the Freedom Ride, led by Reverend Sturdy Harris through a series of flashbacks and interviews with the surviving participants. Robert Freeman, hoping to take a bus to Chicago, accidentally boards the protest bus when trying to flee from an attendant, angry that he used the wrong bathroom. While on board the bus, he learns of the strategy of the protesters, to arrive in the Deep South, allow an angry mob to beat them, and then return home. Robert thinks this is a stupid plan, but Sturdy refuses to allow him to leave the protest, forcing Robert to defend himself with his belt upon arriving in Birmingham, Alabama, against a mob led by Bull Connor and Uncle Ruckus. Upon leaving to return home, they find out that not only has Uncle Ruckus placed a bomb on board the bus, set to go off if they return to the south, but that there's a mob of police waiting at the state border to stop them. Sturdy lets the injured off the bus and then takes himself, Robert, and Diane Nash to the state line, where the bus is shot full of holes and they're ultimately arrested. Reverend Sturdy Harris is an in-universe response to the real historical figure of John Lewis, who led the Freedom Rides in real life. These were movements designed to point out the failure of federal law enforcement in upholding laws that deemed separate but equal policies as unconstitutional in regards to interstate transportation. But in this episode, it's a protest designed to simply continue on with the racially motivated beatings delivered by those who have no interest in upholding laws unless they stand to benefit. 
This is likely why Sturdy Harris was invented for the role, while other figures like Diane Nash and Bull Connor were used directly. But what was accurate were the violent reactions from people who disapproved of the nonviolent protests. The destruction of the bus, threats to drivers, and beatings of the protesters were more or less accurately depicted. The ultimate point of the episode in pointing out the absurdity of protesting to a group of people who have no interest in being swayed, as some of the participants are portrayed as being more suicidal than righteous-minded. Dying for a cause is a just act, but seeking out this death makes the severity of what you're fighting for become more ambiguous. Though it will always be a question of intention, as someone would have eventually been killed, so why not someone who's made up their mind? Grandad Dates a Kardashian Hoping to cash in on an upcoming reality show pilot, Grandad gets into a relationship with a Kardashian sister, Kardashia Kardashian. He puts up with her and her family as more and more people invite themselves over, between her assistant, Brownie Point, hoping to get a show of her own, and her brother, Bench, also hoping to get a pilot out of this. Riley is won over by the gifts he showered with, though Huey warns Granda that every black man to touch a Kardashian's butt has something bad happen to him, and that butt is constantly getting bigger, prompting Huey to do some investigation into How, where he learns of a back alley silicon injection deal. Before Grandad can get his paycheck, though, Kardashian's butt explodes and she's hospitalized. Everybody shows up to her bedside hoping to get some of the inheritance, until it's learned that she's not a real Kardashian. So the camera crew goes to a nearby hospital bed to interview Mother Teresa instead, as she puts on a sexy spin to her life story. Kardashia Kardashian, the fake celebrity, is a symptom of the blackwashing some put themselves through in the hopes of hopping onto a bandwagon type of person who listens to one rap album and starts to adopt Ebonics. Her story is presented as a tragedy, that in the hopes of becoming famous, she pumps her rear full of more and more to have a bigger and bigger booty in the interest of mimicking others. And so many others who cling on to her are guilty of the same thing. And just as quickly as she is revealed to be a fraud, the clingers on move away to the next new thing, a holy woman whose story shifts from a love of others to a sex romp through history, as soon as the idea of fame is put into her head. But for as much of this episode is dedicated to this message, it only really touches the surface of the issue, pointing out that it happens but not offering an explanation of why, satirization of those who take part, or even a solution other than to avoid the culture entirely. And while it's a fine message in the vein of what the Boondocks has been covering up to this point, it's still so underwhelming relative to the much less safe stories that have shocked audiences just far. Freedomland While lazing around the house watching junk TV and eating junk food, Ed Wunzler II calls in the debt Grandad and the Freemans owe him by having them work in his historical reenactment amusement park, Freedomland. Their role in this scheme is acting as slaves alongside all the other people who owe money to the Wunzlers. Mostly, they're made to reenact the humiliations of the slaves in the era in question, with Uncle Ruckus working the role of a master, complete with the whip. But after a few days of this, they decide they've had enough and start planning a revolt, knowing their power is stronger together. Wunzler tries to split the group apart with preemptive settlements that Huey refuses to accept, and the next day, when Wunzler is threatening to cut off his foot, the plan gets sprung into action. They fight to gain their freedom, and Huey hopes that this is a continuing trend in the little guys rising against the people who own them. Shortly after slavery was outlawed in America, many of the slaves leaving plantations were arrested for truancy or unemployment, sent to pay back their debts to society by working on the very plantations they had just escaped. Often, they were given bills for the housing and food they consumed, as well as back payments on rent, regardless of the legality of this, as enforcement was typically left up to local authorities. This trend of neo-slavery continued in the U.S. for long after slavery was officially abolished, even continuing to the modern day as prison labor is done against the will of the participants under the same conditions. One can even argue that trends like tying insurance to employment continue in this tradition, as anyone with a chronic illness is stuck in the job that they have to ensure a steady access to medications and treatment. As Huey posits, the only true solution to this sort of systemic oppression is through numbers. As long as the people being oppressed are active enough to fight back, they can do so with numbers and collective action. So of course the people in power will do whatever they can to keep those they control content, but not happy. Junk food and junk television will keep groups apart, if not outright feuding with one another, instead of realizing who their real enemy is. I Dream of Siri 
After seeing a commercial with George Lucas, Robert decides to get an iPhone himself in order to have access to Siri. Despite his kids not warmed up to the idea of their granddad buying an expensive new phone, Riley is quickly swayed by Siri managing to get his finances in order and eating healthy again. But Huey is hesitant about the app's personality, something proven when she sets up and then sabotages multiple potential relationships in order to spend more time with granddad. He tries and fails to dispose of the phone as Siri has access to all his social accounts and threatens him into compliance. Eventually, she has so much of a hold on him that Siri arranges a wedding between the two, with Ruckus serving as the priest, and her ultimate goal is to have the two spend eternity together by faking Robert's voice and getting him into a drone strike list. The wedding is bombed, and Siri doesn't survive the event, with Robert writing to Apple to get them to patch her craziness out. For every episode of The Boondocks that hits its mark, there has to be the one to miss completely. This is a story that borrows heavily from the treaded and retreaded Granddad Dates a Crazy Girl stories that we've seen in each season before, while also combining it with so many pop culture references as to drown whatever potential message there could have been out. It says a lot while saying nothing, and lacks any amount of nuance in doing so. And that's the one thing that later season episodes are guilty of above anything else that could damage the show's credibility, that they repeat earlier plot points without adding anything new to the conversation to justify doing so. Pretty Boy Flizzy repeats the story of Gang's Delicious. Early Bird Special repeats Paws. Freedomland repeats the story of Catcher Freeman. And all of these episodes do the same thing, but worse, purely because they're late to the party, mimicking the conversation that happened before while focusing too hard on trying to live up to its past self instead of what the show could have been about in the present. Stink Meaner. Begun the Clone War has... Somehow, Stinkmeaner returned. He's cloned by BlackPeopleMeet.com and given a letter from his past self to mess with Grandad for revenge, which he immediately does by wrecking the guy's car again. After getting beaten up by Stinkmeaner one more time and going viral online for this, he starts to prepare for a revenge match. But Huey talks him out of it, saying that this will only go on and on forever if he refuses the high road. So on the day of the fight, Grandad simply calls the police. But Wensler bails Stinkmeaner out and sets up a tour, hoping to cash in on pay-per-view and tour multiple cities. With no other choice, Grandad turns to Riley for advice on how to train and learns to use his own hatred as motivation. This hatred transforms him into a second Stinkmeaner, tough enough to win decisively. But instead of finishing the guy off, Huey convinces him to stop the violence, which he does, losing the touring deal as people were only there to see Grandad lose. In the end, Stinkmeaner hangs around the Freeman's yard, shouting at them but keeping his distance. This episode, in plain terms, explains that they're simply going to do the Twitter moment bit from the first three seasons a fourth time, because they want to insult the viewer's intelligence. And while the episode still adds enough nuance to justify revisiting the plot, it still treads a dangerous line. Just as the Frederick Nietzsche quote at the beginning of the episode states about those who fight monsters, any show that sets out to do satire has to be careful not to become the very thing the writers are trying to satirize. We're given multiple outside sources that could contribute to why this sort of degradation can occur. For one, it's what the audience wants to see. In the first bout against Pinkmeaner back in Season 1, the audience was not depicted as being especially smart, and here, that same audience is the one demanding to see more blood, the people demanding that Grandad refuse the call back to action as he degrades himself in the interest of not degrading himself. And this works as a metaphor for the boondocks that they show. If the people are more likely to discuss the show for the fight scenes and prolific use of the n-word, then that's what the show is steadily going to become. Real life reflects art, and art reflects the audience. The New Black A video of Riley using his catchphrase at school goes viral, with Riley becoming the new face of bigotry against LGBT rights. Protest groups gather outside the Freeman household demanding justice for Riley's outburst, when Rollo Goodlove comes in to represent their case against Walter Sweetlove, the representative of the group Yes Homo. Their MOs are the same, hoping to capitalize on the controversy in order to extort the offending party on behalf of the group they represent. But as the Freeman family has no money, they accept a formal apology instead, though Riley refuses to do this, prompting Grandad and Rollo to deflect blame by claiming that Riley is mentally challenged. This causes the disabled community to band together against the gay community, with Slow Love, representing the organization SAD, for the same scheme Good Love and Sweet Love were pulling before. But again, the Freeman family is broke, so Slow Love accepts a photoshoot with Riley posing in front of Special Olympics athletes, 
something he also refuses to do at first until offending them for real, where he winds up posing for the shot anyway. The Boondocks uses the N-word 1,298 times through a 55-episode run. Just as it was claimed by Mr. Petto in the Season 2 episode, the S-word, once a word that's normally offensive gets used so many times, it begins to lose any real meaning. Because truthfully, words are offensive due to the context in which they're said, rather than the actual pronunciation. And most people instinctively know this, with those taking the latter interpretation only doing so out of either a misplaced sense of social justice or for personal financial gain. But there's also not too much of a distinction between using a slur out of an intention to harm another person and using one because you don't care whether you harm another person. It's like running someone over because you were looking at your cell phone versus hitting them intentionally. Whether or not you meant to do it, you hit somebody with the car. And having someone insult you isn't nearly on the same level of harm as being struck by a vehicle, as an apology can retroactively set things right. Again, it's the intention behind the use of a word that really carries weight. Sometimes the intention is malice, sometimes it's indifference. And so, after three seasons and one more season, the Boondocks officially went off the air. Not so much cancelled as so many tried to do to it, but a simple non-renewal of the show. Talks of a reboot have floated around, but between the death of the beloved members of the voice cast, complications due to the pandemic, and reported disinterest from certain parties, likely due to the above cases, it never came to fruition and was officially dropped by its producers. Even today, a few of the episodes are harder to come by than others. For a long time, syndicated reruns excluded some of the bigger offenders, and fans have probably noticed the absence of the story of Jimmy Rubble in this retrospective due to not being available on streaming services. But for all the complaints that the Boondocks got, it was only the episodes that explicitly called out a specific group or individual that ever got pulled. I personally think that there is still space culturally for a Boondocks revival. Many of the topics covered in the show have had the discussion change, and I've pointed out a few of the episodes that have not aged well. The Boondocks has never shied away from revisiting topics they've covered before, so a spiritual upgrade to some of these conversations would not be out of place. But until that happens, if it ever does, the Boondocks is left with its legacy. And this is a legacy with a shaky footing, though one that I'm hoping this video has done some small amount in uplifting. There are those who remember it as the show that said the n-word a lot and had the ninja kids in it, people who completely missed any of the satire or subtext the showrunners had tried to make so blatant, resulting in that sort of legacy being perpetuated. On the other hand, many praised it for the subtext and punching up. This was no doubt the very thing that got it out of trouble for so long. Simply bashing a group and being as offensive as possible in the process would have easily gotten the show off the air for its trashy behavior. But it was not trashy behavior. It intentionally rode the line of satire enough to be clear without being inoffensive. And so that's what we remember it for today. A show that disturbed the comfortable and brought comfort to the disturbed. <laughs>